Let's uh, go ahead and start the uh, study session. We're missing one meeting, one member, but we are going to go ahead and start. Genevieve. Genevieve. Um, we will start with public comment on any agenda items and um, looking at some public out there, I'm guessing we're going to have some. Jesse, did you want to? All right. Please give your name so that Bruce can. Your name and address, please. Jesse Hill, 2995 Chase Street. I'd like to discuss item number two, draft 2014 citizen survey. First off, sincerely thank staff for preparing uh, the 2014 draft survey questions. Um, first, to have a community review and discussion. Uh, for some of you newer council members in the past, uh, I think due to time restrictions, the survey was kind of slip sheeted in, and uh, the general public really didn't have opportunity to, to make comment on it. So it's a great opportunity for me to be here today. So as an advocate of uh, government transparency and uh, inclusiveness, I ask that you might consider adding the following question to the survey. I've got some copies here, be happy to pass out. I'll save one for Bruce. Uh, proposed 2014 citizen survey question. How important is it to you that the city engage in the following government transparency initiatives? And the standard terms, and I'll let you guys discuss, or the professionals on what it is, but the main points being one would be, like the format of what we have, public comment at study sessions, video recording and publishing of regular council meetings, video recording and publishing of regular council study sessions, recording of minutes of the city council retreat study session, and having the city register, i.e. the city checkbook, published to the public or available online. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me on those, but also to you know, offer a productive dialogue here today on uh, policy, and I understand this survey truly is gonna be limited on space and scope. Um, first, I'd like the record to show that I am one of the biggest advocates in Wheat Ridge for physical activity and fresh fruits and vegetables out there. But if it comes to it, I'd ask that we, uh, replace question number eight with this uh, opportunity here uh, that I've presented you. Um, and, and number eight kind of, without going into detail, it's, you know, how many times have you done physical activity alone, offered to do physical activity with another, discussed eating habits with one another, offered one another fruits and vegetables when visiting? Um, and again, big advocate of fruits and vegetables, but uh, this just kind of sounds a little creepy to me personally. Um, Kind of reminds me of something in 1984, or the Hunger Games of kind of an overreaching state. Uh, again, when people you know joke about the nanny state, I think this is what they're referring to. Uh, number two, what's more important also is that I think it's gonna be a distraction to the quality of the survey that we've got here. When you look at question seven and nine and the rest of it, they really follow a great format out there. And uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it just seems like it's a little out of place. And uh, and I understand why, you know, it's, if, if special interest organizations want to do a survey, they can. I, pr I encourage them, and I've done them before in the past, and they should, but it really should be done on their dime and their time, because it just doesn't fit with the, the nature of this being literally, as referred to, the, the city's consumer report card. Uh, it's just a little awkward in there. So, again, I, I thank you for taking these proposals seriously. Um, as usual, my interest are more on the process of how we do business here yes, in Wheat Ridge. That's, you're at three minutes now. Okay, well again, thank you for the time. It's the process that matters. Do we have someone else? To discuss, okay. Okay, oh here's fine. Good evening, Kim Calamino. Thank you for the opportunity. I think the survey is well crafted. I would echo comments I made at the last study session that as you consider whether or not to put forward a ballot issue on heightened density, which of course is in our city charter, that perhaps the city sur the citizen survey is another opportunity to ask citizens if they think it might be time to uh, revisit a document that was created many years ago, has been, of course, amended over time, but whether or not there might be um, an opportunity to create a, a charter commission 
to revisit, uh, update, amend, and, and pr potentially remove any appropriate, inappropriate uh, conditions uh, vested in the charter. Thank you. Thank you. We have another speaker. I'm sorry, uh, we couldn't hear that. It's nice to join you on Casual Monday. This oh, okay. Thank you so much for letting us be here. My name is Jennifer Shepard. I live at 7 Twilight Drive. Jennifer and Shepard? Shepard, yes. Okay. S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D. It's on. Is it on? Sure. Maybe pull yes. a little bit closer. Um, this past week, I attended the legislative lowdown, which um, was at the Children's Hospital of Colorado, and it was, uh, by, it was presented by their grassroots advocacy network. And... Um, they uh, were excited to report that they passed House Bill 1361 and 1366, which both deal with uh, the marijuana edibles and uh, concentrates. So 1361 deals with the concentrates, since really that is still to be determined as far as when the law was passed uh, for one ounce of marijuana. Now we have the, uh, ed the edible concentrates. So um, that brings that discussion into further regulating how that will be put into the edibles serving size and uh, get that conversation, that regulation further discussed. And then 1366 dealt with the edible industry and uh, with regards to edible safety. And they are no longer allowed to spray um, pre-made food, such as, as I had mentioned before, um, uh, not Rice Krispies, but Fruity Pebbles and uh, Oreos. So they are no longer allowed to spray pre-made foods um, but they just they have to make them in house, so that's exciting because again the big concern is accidental ingestion and uh, even just the industry making products that um, are enticing to kids. So we would have liked to see maybe um, a little bit um, more aggressive legislation with regards to that. But uh, so definitely there's some more works in progress with that. Um, so also with regards to that, so the stamp did come out, so products will be made with a stamp, which is great, but again, we would still love to not see products uh, made uh, in enticing to children. Um, so again, back to as we talk about um, the MIP discussion and the products that they're gonna be making, there is still so much to discuss and so much to consider with regards to regulation um, of the industry and the products. So I, I thank you for taking the time to further consider that and further look into that. Um, I also, um, they also talked about Senate Bill 155 where um, they have released some money to uh, do research on assessing cannabinoids. And there is a trial study at NYU assessing the effects of cannabinoids on epilepsy. So I know there's always a concern of uh, making sure that people who need the products get their products. So there is research in place with regards to that. Um, I've also been working pretty closely and just trying to understand um, how some of the other public health organizations, how, how do we deal with this um, as marijuana continues to come into our community? How do we protect our kids and children? Um, from uh, Boulder County, uh, they have their statistics and uh, again, more, more than four in 10 Boulder County High School students representing approximately 7,000 students have ever used marijuana, which is 40, 41%. And unfortunately, Jeffco Public Schools has op have opted out of participating in the state-supported youth health, health surveys. So we're not gonna be able to get that great picture of how, um, of how the marijuana industry is affecting our high schools. So that might be something for us to consider your time is up. Great. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello? Good evening. My name is Dr. Mark Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Jefferson County Public Health Department, and thank you for this opportunity of meeting with you. I am not officially representing either the county or the health department, but I'm here to talk about some of the issues that I as a citizen am concerned about in the area of marijuana. <clears throat> One of the real problems that we have, we always try to be as much as possible based on good data and good statistics, good studies. One of the problems that we are finding is because marijuana has been illegal for so long, Many of the studies that probably should have been done haven't been done, and some of the studies that have been done in this country had to utilize the marijuana that was grown in the, in the federal Mississippi grow uh, area, and it is nothing like what we are seeing being grown here in Colorado as far as the 
the strength of the THC, which is the active component in the marijuana. So we are seeing much higher levels of the, uh, both the addictive and the active substance in the marijuana, both in the, that that's being smoked and in the, the food stuffs that are being uh, used that um, we really don't know exactly what all of the final ramifications of it are going to be in the population. As we look at the trends, though, we do see trends that tend to, to, to help sort of support some of the generalizations or the stereotypes that I think most of us have had about people who use marijuana, that it does tend to mellow people out to such a degree that they tend to lose uh, 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 their ambition and initiative, that there is there are studies now that show that it does decrease the IQ by about eight points, particularly if it started in children or in, in adolescents, if they begin to use it at young ages, so that we begin to have both the cognitive uh, decrease as well as the decrease in judgment in people that are using it. And we're finding one of the public health problems that we're very concerned about is there's a decrease in the motor skills so that we begin to see more motor accidents. We begin to see more accidents at work, particularly around heavy equipment, those types of things that uh, cause a great deal of concern to those of us in, in public health and in pub public safety uh, arena. We also are seeing that uh, it does have li lifelong uh, effects, particularly if a pregnant mother uses it, that their, the child will have lifelong uh, deficits in their learning ability and uh, in their cognitive and motor skills. So we feel, from the public health point of view, that this is a good time to continue moratoria where they are in place, to wait a bit until we can see a little bit more what the, the data is going to show. There are more studies now being done, particularly using the, the marijuana that we have here in Colorado that has uh, the high content of THC, to get a better idea of really what are we dealing with with the increased availability of this to our kids. One thing that we have seen right away is that the perception that it is harmful to kids has changed dramatically. And I'm we are sorry, sir. Your time is up. Thank you. We're beginning to Thank see you. increases, and we are very concerned and would encourage you to continue the moratorium. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Do we have any other speakers? It appears not. Um, we're looking at the agenda tonight and wondering if we could uh, rearrange the agenda a little bit. Claudia Worth is with us here tonight. Uh, it's a little bit harder for her to stay that long. And is it possible to remove the historical society discussion up to number one? Madam Chair, I'd make a consensus to move uh, that to item number one, the um, part-time position to number one. No opposition on that? OK, let's go ahead with that discussion. Um, Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, we discussed this with City Council um, at our April 21st uh, study session, and um, there was direction to, from, from Council to bring back um, several items, and the, and the first item which we are bringing back tonight is, is um, uh, uh, support and funding for part-time um, staff help for the Historical Society. Um, the other items were to look at a five-year operating plan and um, that includes educational outreach and also an archival um, program or system. Uh, those items um, we're going to bring back at a, at a later study session, but we thought it'd be prudent to uh, bring back the uh, part-time um, paid position as soon as possible so that uh, they could get that position filled for the summer months especially. Um, and uh, so uh, Joyce Manwaring did um, work with HR and, and uh, Claudia Worth also and, and created a job description. We put a few of um, a little bit of information about the job description in, in your memo, the essential duties and the job de definition. And it's my understanding Claudia um, worked with Joyce directly on that and, and was happy with that job description. Um, this would fit within um, uh, our current um, part-time part, part pay plan with the city. Um, and the top of the range is at uh, $10.82 an hour. It, um, we determined it would fit in within that range of an employee. Um, so a, a budget impact would be 
uh, for 20 hours a week, um, June through the end of November, the, the uh, museum is, is closed in December. So for the rest of the year would be a budget impact of about $5,626 to fund this position. Um, so um, if there's not any questions, um, or if there's questions, we'd be here to answer those. And yes, Bud. I noticed just at the end of this that uh, prior to the 2002 budget appropriations where we, uh, we shrank our budget, we were allocating 11,000 or about twice this amount for a part-time employee for the museum one day a week. Um, is this, are we, are we now proposing sort of less time or less pay or? That was for a full year. Um, the 5,600 would be just for the rest of this year. Um, okay. So it's about the same for so a on an annualized basis. Yep. Then. So yep. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald. Um, thank you very much for the job description work, but I really think that this kind of misses the mark. Um, I'm in favor of hiring a part-time person, uh, but I think the primary job of that person should be to uh, organize the, co the collection in a searchable form. Um, and in the essential duties, I don't see that, although the word organize is there. Mm -hmm. But I don't see this person's primary duties as sitting on the desk and uh, talking to visitors. I see the primary yeah. role as one of organizing. Well, w w as we discussed at the April 21st study session, we, we um, decided that it's probably difficult to, to get both in the same person. So um, the primary need for the historical society was, was somebody to lead tours and to staff the museum so that they could be open uh, more often. But there is also a need, definitely, that council directed us to, um, to look at to archive and organize um, the historic artifacts. But um, we, we believe that needs to be handled through probably a contract um, with um, a professional service or firm that could do that for us. Um, and that's the second piece that we'd like to bring back to council at a later date. Um, this would just um, give the Historical Society the part-time help they need to keep the museum open, um, provide tours. And they could do some work with, with starting to maybe um, help the volunteers organize the stuff. But archival of, of historic documents and, and items takes um, more professional help. And I think that we, we feel that's better um, done through a, a separate contract. Mr. Dutulio. So on the memo from staff, uh, Don requested action. It talks about one was the approval of the part-time position for $5,000 plus. And then number two was direction on moving forward to develop a scope of work and find a consultant to develop a five-year operating plan and include programming, use of facilities, policy development, and on archive retention and recommendations on document and filing. So based on those two recommendations, I would I would say it, I support those two moving forward with uh, the requested actions on one and two. And that would be a consensus if nobody else had any questions. Ms. Davis. I just have a, <coughs> sorry, I just have a quick question. I guess, yeah, I, I support both actions, but I guess my question would be more the consultant part of it. Is the consultant going to be the worker? We're not going to hire somebody to tell us what to do and then do it, are we? Um, or is I, the I, consultant more like the historian that would kind of set up a plan and do it? I, I don't know at this point. Um, we need to research that, that. We need more time to look at that. I don't know what services are out there. I'm sure there's archivists that can either put a plan together or actually come in and do the work for you. So, I mean, if the direction is to, to have um, just to do the work, that's, that would be the scope of our services contract. Or um, if you want a plan put in place, the direction, we, the consensus we got from city council last time was to put together a five-year operating plan um and then also to look at the archival so yeah um, I, guess I think those are probably separate items where the five-year operating plan could probably be done in a house but the archival um, um actual work and plan probably needs to be done by a professional I, okay i i agree with the archiving plan yeah. and and that type of thing i yeah. just don't want a consultant on top of a you know plan on top of a yeah that's that's my only okay mr urban thank you um with respect to the uh, hiring of the consultant, um, what I'd like to ask is that we have discussions with people like the city of Arvada or Lakewood or Denver that have museum facilities that are much larger than what we're working with here. 
to understand better what their business model is for funding that or where those funds come from, uh, as well as there may be an opportunity to work with CU Denver, CU Boulder, or DU to uh, employ an intern over the summer to it, whether, I'm not sure the specific uh, field that they would be coming from, but it might be a good opportunity for a college intern to help us, uh, like what Tim was suggesting, be able to file things in a proper way, have a good methodology behind it, and it would go towards their college credit. So I'd like to at least consider those options versus uh, starting right away with hiring a, a archiving consultant of some kind. Yeah, no, and all options are open at this time, and, and maybe I misspoke when I said a consultant, but um, we need to research um, what options are available to um, archive our artifacts, um, and that hasn't been done yet, and that's why we haven't brought anything forward. So we'll look at all options, including um, other cities, what they're doing, internships, um, funding sources, all of the above. And I know that the National Archives, um, I think it's as a part of the Department of Interior, may have grants available for that type of work, so. And actually there was something, yeah, it's interesting, the timing was pretty good, CML, um, C the CML newsletter in the last week or so had a grant, a small grant, just a couple thousand dollars for this exact thing, so um, Nathan forwarded that on to Joyce Manwaring, so. And it may be good to figure out who's received those in the past, what they've mm -hmm. done with it, so we're making the best use out of those monies. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like we're, um, approving two things tonight, for staff to go ahead, first of all, to authorize a part-time position, as well as do some research as far as creating a consultant or a direction for the historical society so that we can get those records in a in, uh, better, better state of use. That was my consensus. Or... Yeah, so I, I think that's where we're at. Um, we're not necessarily approving a part-time position or anything we, right now. We're we, we are approval of funding, funding for, for a part-time position. This is for... How can we approve the funding for that here? Well, it's going to come forward. Okay. Yeah, it'll have to come forward. It'll yeah, have to I come mean, forward. You're giving us direction to bring back a supplemental okay. budget appropriation right. for that. That's what I want to hear. All right. All right, do we have any more? I think you have what you need then. I do. Thank okay. you. Unless there's more questions. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. Yes? Claudia? All the archiving you're talking about belongs to the historical society, not to the city. The, histor the city owns Johnson's collection. It is archived, and people don't really go into it that much because it's mostly his personal papers and um, his case records. And there are some things that are important that I guess I'm not allowed to talk about, okay? Second thing is, if we have somebody down at the museum, it's going to save the city money in damages and just the kids in the neighborhood breaking windows. A window out of the sod house to replace it with the, I call it the wiggly glass, but it's rolled glass, old rolled glass. You can get it in New York, it's $400 a pane. So far this year we've had, I think, Four panes broke out in the Saudi, at least two in the log cabin, and a baseball through the one in the post office. And that one is a huge I think somebody window. On staff would be better. And because the deductible is so high with the city that it comes out of the park fund somewhere. I don't know how Joyce pays for it, but they have to be fixed. And so with school coming out, we used to have a lady that lived across the street, and bless her heart, nobody did anything to that property. <laughs> she was over there at midnight, this little thing, running around chasing people out. So, but she's gone now, she passed away, and since then we've had all this damage. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And it's really um, hard, even though the parks people are there all summer, the kids are out of school and it sounds like we have another item to deal with then as far as, as no, the... No, it's just, if somebody's there every day, you know, it helps. I'm sure it does. Go out and say, first thing Charlotte did was put him in charge of the museum and the, of the property. 
And we had one of the students that she put in charge of the property when he was about 10 years old come back and he's doing his bachelor's or master's in history. That's great. So it worked and, and she just made him the guards of the park, you know. Okay, well, we, we will have somebody apparently at least 20 hours a week there, if, if that will help somewhat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, for a lot of years. Okay, um, let's move on to item number one, which is the the marijuana discussion. And before we quite go into that discussion, just for the the situation, because we have we have. Um, citizens listening to this discussion and just to make some clarification points the fact that we started out with medical marijuana then we went into uh, retail or recreational marijuana and now we're looking at man marijuana manufacturing I thought I'd ask Patrick if he would kind of explain um, what our goal is here as we review these these various areas thank you mayor um, and just for a quick introduction if you I think Carmen's been in front of this new council is everybody seen Carmen Berry is with um, with uh, Jerry Dahl's firm, and uh, she helped us um, draft this memo and um, is our, I guess, our resident expert now on marijuana, correct? No, you don't want that? Um, so um, then we also have the chief and, and um, Ken Johnstone here to answer any questions. But as you all remember, um, council did uh, direct staff to um, draft an emergency ordinance um, for a 90-day moratorium um, and in the end, the moratorium, based on your direction, is just on the processing of new applications, um, the acceptance and processing of new applications for marijuana-infused products, um, licenses, permits, land use approvals. Um, uh, at first, we were suggesting testing facilities also, but that was amended out of the uh, ordinance. So right now, all we're talking about tonight is, is um, marijuana-infused products licensing. Um, we, the city has adopted ordinances for both medical and retail um, recreational marijuana in the city. Um, there's four different license classes and two of those, um, cultivation or grow and retail, or, or yeah, retail, um, there are restrictions um, placed on those types of businesses um, in regards to um, uh, distance restrictions on how close they or how far away they need to be from certain classes of other um, uh, uses such as schools, um, daycare centers, drug treatment facilities, um, and then they also have to be a certain distance away from each other. Um, those same restrictions are not put on testing and, and marijuana infused um, manufacturing um, products, licenses. So that is the intention of the moratorium is to put a hold on those applications so council can um, discuss that issue if you want to put those same types of restrictions on the infused products. Um, there was a few other items that um, we also included in um, your memorandum for discussion tonight and those were brought up at the May 6 study session um, by council uh, member um, Wooden and there was consensus to add those items to this discussion also and those items are um, the discussion about a permanent ban on all um, future um, acceptance of, of new applications for um, any type of, of marijuana business, and then also a discussion about um, how the city uses the, the current um, revenues that we're seeing from um, these businesses, um, and if, that, if those revenues should be earmarked, and I, I believe council member um, wouldn't suggest that at least 50% of those should go to some type of school use. Um, and then there's also one other item in here um, which has been on our list um, to talk to you about, and that has to do with um, um, home occupation regulations and um, the amount of space um, a personal caregiver can can dedicate their home to um, for the, the use or the use of the business. Um, there's no current regulation on how much um, square footage of a home can be used for um, their um, 
for their business. Um, so that's a discussion point. And then one other um, item that we'd like to discuss also is, which has been a question with city council, is um, a consideration of any regulations that would reduce or minimize odors um, coming from these types of businesses. So um, those are all of the um, items and we have those um, kind of spelled out clearly in eight separate um, points under policy direction. And once we get to that, um, we can go through those one, one by one and try to get some direction on those. Okay, let's maybe the best way would be to just start with these questions with number one. And uh, do I have some discussion there? So this, no, no, I'm, I'm wondering if this is premature. Um, for one thing, the state is working on a lot of these items right now. And uh, for another, we heard from Dr. Johnson earlier that uh, a lot of the research hasn't been done. Um, I think this is, this is too, too diverse um, a project here. We're talking about home-based marijuana growing with manufacturing businesses. Uh, to me, this is, this is just too big a bite and it's premature. And I, I suggest that we just uh, pass this forward and separate some of these things out. So I'd, I'd like to ask for a consensus that we not discuss this now. Any of it. And just remember, we have a moratorium have a in, place in place that will expire in 90 days. Right. Um, but if that's your intent to let it expire. My intent is to let okay. it expire. Ms. Davis? Um, I guess I'm not aware of some of the stuff that the state's doing right now. I mean, I know some of it, but um, I do feel that, like the smell, the odor, um, it seems as that's impacting a lot of people. And if we could put some things in place on that, um, at least for the time being, I, I would like to look at that. And I, you know, I, you know, looking at some of these bullets, I'd have to look through. But I, I do think there might be a couple things we might be able to put in place just from a community standpoint and a, and a request of our community. I certainly would be okay with talking about odor. I have no problem with that. I wouldn't, and I would be okay with talking about uh, safety, that is to say health inspections. If, I mean, we don't have any role in health inspections as far as I know, but uh, I'm okay with health inspections. I'm okay with, uh, uh, fire suppression for a commercial kitchen if, or requirement of a commercial kitchen for edible product. I'm, I'm fine with all those things. And, and all those things are, are already in place. Um, the, these types of businesses um, have to meet the city's um, building codes um, if they're either classified as a manufacturing or a commercial kitchen. Um, our codes cover all those, so um, we, we don't, those are not um, any questions or that we have as staff for you this evening or needing direction on, um, those items are covered. So let's, let's just talk about uh, odor. Uh, Mr. DiTullio, head it. I would highly suggest that, that we really consider what we're doing here. Many of our surrounding cities, Golden now has banned, Arvada, Westminster, uh, Morrison, um, and Littleton. Littleton's on moratorium, Lakewood's on moratorium, and Golden is going to ban. I think we should stop the train right now and see what happens going forward. And I did bring some, and these are numerous, data points that we don't really know what this is going to do to the health of our community. We don't really know what this is going to do to our youth. And here we are in Wheat Ridge saying, okay, come on in, and we already have all these businesses, but we don't know the effects on our community or even the state, and the state's still looking at it. So why should we continue to do this when we don't know the effects? And we, it could be years before we know the effects. Um, and I do have a question for the lawyer. Carmen. I'm Carmen, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what liability exposure is there for the city if someone was to be poisoned harmed or even die as a result of a business that we have licensed? No greater than, you know, is that on? No greater than the city's liability for 
any kind of a business or product that might harm um, someone if they consume it, if someone is overserved alcohol, for instance, or if someone, um, if a manufacturer manufactures a product that proves to be unsafe, it's really the manufacturer of that product that faces the liability. The city, by virtue of licensing um, someone to engage in a business, does not explicitly or implicitly condone any activity conducted pursuant to that business that, that is harmful to people, particularly when unlawful. And when you're, you know, as was commented here tonight, this, there's states still trying to figure out how to regulate manufacturing of these products and what is safe and what isn't. So I understand your concern. The city's liability, in my opinion, is, is relatively low simply by virtue of issuing a license to a business to engage in lawful activity. Okay, but we don't really know. Is there a possibility that should the federal stance be changed? I mean, I, I think there's a question. Do, does the city have a liability? And I know, you're, I guess you're saying no, but I think there is a possibility that we don't know. There's, and the federal government and the current inconsistency, right, in the states that have legalized marijuana with the federal law, I mean, that is certainly present. Local government is aware of that. Local government employees are aware of that. You know, to the best of our knowledge up to this time, the federal government has not expressed any kind of a willingness to come after local government or its employees for following the mandate um, of local law, particularly when the people of states like Colorado have adopted a constitutional amendment saying we want to allow this kind of thing. So, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that there's any context in which you can say there's never any liability, right. um, but our assessment is that it's relatively low for the government and its employees, so long as they are acting within the bounds of Amendments 20 and 64. Okay. Right. Uh, on the item that I passed out, I just want to point out that while uh, the total number of car crashes in our state has declined, the number of fatalities from drivers that tested possible positive for marijuana has increased. And just again, I put in there what our Wheat Ridge Vision 2025 is, and do we believe that these businesses are what we want in our community to exemplify active, healthy lifestyle? I also have in here from the Jefferson County Moratorium information that they have put together on a cost-benefit analysis, potential negative consequences, and positive. Uh, the next article is about marijuana used, uh, use involved in fatal accidents. The next one is about increase in child pot exposure and fatal, not fatal, but uh, uh, poisonings. And then the last one is also about poisonings. I guess I'm just asking why rush ahead when there's so much that we don't know. Can we take a moratorium indefinitely until we know more about these things? And in fact, can we say we'll visit it every three to four months? Okay, Genevieve, um, I understand what you would like to do then for is hold on to the moratorium. Um, and we probably need to go forward with the, an the questions that we absolutely have to answer and see if we lead there. Yeah, j just maybe to get back on track a little bit and not, not to stop discussion. I think there needs to be discussion, but I mean, action was taken by city council to put a moratorium in place. And I think out of fairness to the citizens and fairness to the business businesses, um, that probably need, that should be discussed at, at some some amount of discussion if you're going to extend it, you're going to cancel it, or um, if you want to put some regulations in place. So um, questions one through um, four um, really deal specifically with um, with the moratorium on on the MIPS, the medical um, infused mar marijuana infused products. Um, um, and that, that's really what's on the table. You have that moratorium in place. You have 90 days to, to uh, make decision on that. You, you could not do anything and let it expire, um, or you, you could extend it for permanently. So um, I think, I think it would be nice if we could go through items one through four and have discussion on those and come to conclusion on those, and then we can discuss the other items, odor, and, and other things. Well, I think Mr. Um, Fitzgerald made a consensus not to do one through four, basically, with a start with odor. Isn't that true? I'd, I'd rather put no, I separate, separate, separate this out into components and work on it in a different way. Is that my consensus? 
so, so the first question to do that then, the first question is, should marijuana infused products manufacturing establishments be required to meet the same or similar separation requirements as currently apply to medical marijuana centers and retail marijuana stores? Um, Let's... Okay. Well, All right. Need, so, the so the first thing we need to do is ascertain whether we want to continue discussion and go through these points, or we want to actually stop this discussion and just let the mar the moratorium expire. Is is that pretty much what you're asking? And maybe legal should respond to that too. I mean, right. council put a moratorium in place. I mean, can no discussion is an option. <laughs> It's, it, well, the, the stated purpose of the moratorium and the moratorium ordinance was to permit study um, of these particular issues. Certainly, if it is now, after some consideration, some time has passed, it's, if it's now council's pleasure that, that your consideration has occurred and, and done, that's, that's your choice. If you do not take any further action to amend regulations or address the issues that um, you originally stated were the intent of the moratorium to address, obviously those issues wouldn't change, those regulations wouldn't change, and you'd be back to where you started. But what about my question then, what do we do to continue the moratorium? Because that that, be that's a, a separate consensus, and then we're not voting on it tonight, correct? It's just a consensus. Correct. Correct. First, there's consensus on the floor to not have discussion on this, so. Well, let's, let's 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 yeah. let's start with that. I would, I would like to discuss it. All right, thank you. Um, I may have to ask for a show of hands uh, as to that members that would like to continue the discussion on these first four items. And one, two, three, four, five. We will go forward afterward. This is just to get us through this port because at this point, the question is, is, do we even need to go through these first four things? So this is a question as to, are we gonna discuss the first four things or not? That doesn't mean that item five, six, and seven are changed. This is regulating um, MIPS. Right. The one through four is, has to do with regulating And my, my sense products. that I'm getting is that the, the bulk of the, of the council would like to go ahead and just okay. make the discussion of the first four items. So can we return to the first item, George? I'll just hit the first four. Um, and I look at these, you know, and I agree we should be talking about this um, and that it's complicated and it's all important. I will say that I look at the first four really from just a land, a land use and, um, um, and, and kind of approved, approved uh, business use within, within land use designation in our, in our code. Um, that's just the lens I put on this because frankly, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how this specific business use ought to be regulated um, specifically through our, our land use ordinances. Um, and my particular take on it is, is that, you know, th this is dissimilar to um, uh, the other, the other um, marijuana type businesses that we have discussed, whether it be medical or retail. And again, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with, with the notion of marijuana, uh, the, the point is, is that this is a type of business that is um, essentially a manufacturing business. Um, and from, from that standpoint, whether it relates to um, how it's pre presenting itself in the, in the community, it's perceived or actual risks of that manufacturing. Um, it's already been stated that it's going to be regulated through, um, through the, uh, the um, uh, building department codes and other, other um, land use codes that we already have. From, from, from that standpoint, for all those reasons, uh, I would not treat it like the other things that we've, we've talked about, and I would answer no to um, and questions one through four. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Urban. Um, I think that it is a land use issue. Uh, my concern is the, uh, the two things that will attract crime to these establishments, irrespective of whether or not they're, they have any kind of public interface, is that they have marijuana and cash, because these manufacturers are still uh, outside of the banking community, uh, regardless of the 
whether or not they're they have any sort of retail storefront or any signage, uh, they still cannot bank as a normal business might. And so, um, I guess my question to the chief is that um, the having this thousand foot distance uh, does that help mitigate the potential for uh, crimes near these daycares, schools, drug treatment facilities, and the like? And what would be the benefit of having that thousand foot distance in order to isolate them, so to speak, in order to reduce the crime near these areas of concern like schools, daycares, and the like? You know, like this whole issue with marijuana, uh, you know, we, we learn something every day as as we move forward with this so initially we weren't seeing a lot of crime in wheat ridge uh, with uh, uh, with any of our uh, marijuana uh, stores uh, we have seen an uptick in crime we've had one business that's had two burglaries in the last two weeks with vehicles being driven through the wall uh, stealing marijuana plants uh, other jurisdictions have seen crime associated with uh, with these, but uh, and and we certainly have too. But it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be to the degree yet that I would raise my hand and say, Psh, we need you know we need to stop this. We need to deal with it. I think the issue in regards to the separation requirement is really how close you want uh, uh, marijuana uh, businesses to schools and daycares uh, and those kinds of facilities because the whole idea behind having those sort of drug-free zones is you create a zone around these kinds of businesses uh, so it doesn't have the commercial or the marketing impact on, 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 on your children. And so that, to me, would be the, you know, the bigger concern is what, you know, when, if you're going to uh, not have separation requirements and not have, uh, you know, a distance requirement from these facilities, then, you know, I can't tell you today what the impact of this would be on our schools or our kids. But I can tell you we're seeing more marijuana in schools. Uh, we're, we're seeing more arrests of people under the age of 18 in our schools. And we're seeing more marijuana in our elementary schools, both medically infused products as well as actual marijuana. And I guess my, my follow-up to that was in many cases, schools are designated as a drug-free zone with some designation of a buffer of a thousand feet or how does that play into this that schools already have identified drugs not be allowed within a thousand feet of their premise but then we are allowing that placement by land use designation to be there well by the adoption of of, amend, of, of the amendments 20 and 64 the state has has done away with the uh, what was a federal requirement and a state requirement for separations and they've allowed that issue to be decided uh, locally uh, at a local control basis and Carmen may have more information that she may want to provide on that but that's essentially what happened when the state revised and created this Colorado regulation book they did away with that uh, uh, part of the Controlled Substance Act that, uh, that created that thousand foot buffer so it's up to you know our jurisdiction to make a determination do we want to keep it a thousand feet 500 feet or no feet so is it the federal government is no longer enforcing that, but it's still there? Well, I, I think that the, the issue from a federal perspective has uh, certainly been a, 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 you know, a hands-off kind of situation to see how this evolves. I can't tell you when or if the federal government is, is going to step in uh, to address things or to continue to let this uh, play out, so to speak, both in Colorado and Washington and and, and other states is, is, is this movement to, to legalize marijuana or medical marijuana continues. And then just from a policy perspective, have other cities removed the separation requirement and what if any impacts have occurred because they've removed that separation or the cities that do not have a separation requirement, what has been the impact from that? I can tell you from my discussions with uh, 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 our area superintendent that they're seeing uh, an increase in drug-related uh, arrests and issues in, in, in all of our schools in Jefferson County. Uh, I can't give you the exact facts and figures, but certainly if you wanted me to provide those at another date, I could certainly you know, do that. Uh, in terms of what other municipalities are doing in regards to separation uh, requirements, 
I really don't have an idea. Carmen may have a better idea from some of the other jurisdictions that uh, that she represents, but I, I don't have an answer to that question today. Okay. And then my last question, maybe for staff, regarding uh, simple manufacturing, whether it's light, heavy, whatever, uh, is that just from a land use perspective beneficial or detrimental to have near schools, daycares, and the like, or um, is there any? concern about having manufacturing of any kind near schools? Um, I'll let Ken maybe address that. I mean, that's, I don't know if we have a, he has a no answer to that either, but I mean, we, we, we don't have separation requirements for any other type of manufacturing. Um, I mean, they're, they're specifically zoned for certain areas of the city, but um, I'll let Ken maybe speak to that. I mean, the last point is certainly correct. We don't have separation requirements for other manufacturing types of uses. Um, Obviously, the, the building codes probably you know, treat uh, manufacturing uses in a fairly um, complex way. So, you know, more triggers for fire suppression um, for, for obvious reasons, uh, more triggers for HVAC requirements to, to make sure they're properly vented. Uh, and as Patrick already noted, those requirements do generally apply to the, the MIPS that we've, that we've processed so far. So we treat them as commercial kitchens, we treat them as manufacturing occupancies, so they, they really have to comply with a fairly strict set of building codes. From a more pure land use perspective, I mean, I would say that, you know, the manufacturing uses are allowed in essentially two zoning districts, the IE, industrial employment, and the C2 district. Mm -hmm. C2 we have very little of around the city, um, but the IE is fairly prominent, um, generally north of, um, of I-70 and to a lesser extent along Youngfield in, in, in that area and then uh, that small sliver of, of 44th that goes over um, kind of north of the creek where we've got the established industrial park. Um, and I think those locations are fairly conscious, you know, ver for, we're very consciously made. Uh, most of our schools are located in residential zone districts. Uh, so you'd have kind of that natural uh, separation that would occur just by the fact that um, manufacturing facility, our, our zoning map has been laid out so that we, we try and separate the residential districts that includes the schools from the more employment uses. Sure. I guess one, one last question, sorry. Um, what, what discussion or outreach or conversation has there been with the fire department regarding this kind of manufacturing, if any concerns have arisen in that discussion or? Not to my knowledge. Um, and again, a, a stricter set of fire codes would, would apply as well. Oh, Ken, if I may ask, does manufacturing necessarily mean that sales would take place as well, or, or is that not con it, same it, with it? Uh, it doesn't typically mean that, that sales would take place, no. Okay. Mr. DeTulli, uh, yeah. So you, you just answered one of my questions. So manufacturing does not include sales, is that correct? Correct. Is that state law? So even if we were to say these establishments are not allowed in Wheat Ridge, and uh, we passed a full moratorium on this forever. Isn't it state law allows everybody over 21 at a household to grow six plants? Correct. So my concern is not necessarily the legal businesses that are buying a permit and moving into the city and being regulated by the city. My concern, I mentioned it in email that I guess, I don't know if you, you mentioned it in here, it's, I guess it's number six, is the illegal aspect of this going on in households with hash oil and, and illegal MIP. So, and you know, really, uh, I've been at the high school, we're seeing an increase of marijuana because families are growing it and parents are growing it. And whether it's sex, dr sex drugs or rock and roll or alcohol, parents are, are responsible for taking care of their kids and educating them. I don't see how us banning MIPS or regulating the, um, the retail and medical that are legal businesses operating in the city by the Constitution. It's more the problem of educating the parents and the students that what the dangers are, and then they have to make a decision. So uh, I have to agree with uh, Mr. Pond that I think one through four probably shouldn't be addressed because they're not selling these at the, at the MIPs. They're not selling infused products. So I would agree that one through four really don't apply to these because it's not retail, it's not medical. And I would just remind everybody that we could ban all this, like at like Arvada and Lakewood and Golden, but you still have the element of people growing this in their backyard, six plants per, per adult. And if the parents aren't teaching their, their students, their high school kids or elementary kids 
what the pros and cons of this are, it's not going to help any. So I agree with Mr. Pond and Mr. Fitzgerald and that I think we should not do anything. I would say no one through four. And I, I also, but I do think that five, six, and eight should be discussed as a similar options. Ms. Langworthy. All right, so I, I actually am in favor, I mean, not a big surprise. I have always been in favor of regulation of this. I have a small child and I agree that it is a parent's responsibility but our children have more influence at school than they have at home many times. They spend equal portion of their day during the school year at school. Um, and their, their peers have as much or more of an impact on them than I do. Um, and you can't control that, and I can't control that. And I get that. But I'm looking at this map, and we have six schools within a, th I mean, it seems within a thousand feet because of the the pink C1 zone butts up to the school. I mean, we got um, Pennington, Everett Middle School, we have Com Compass Montessori, um, we have the Mountain Phoenix, we have, it looks like we have Stevens and, um, and Wheat Ridge 5A, and, and then the, the uh, St. Peter and Paul, St. Peter and Paul Mary school there's six schools that are within that thousand feet and I get that they're not advertising they're not and I probably got the name wrong I'm so sorry um, Peter Paul okay I was gonna rock yeah see the quitting but we have six schools within a thousand feet of that and and while I get they're not advertising and not selling it it is still culturally something they see and it impacts them I mean, I, I, I would at least ask to to buffer the schools. I mean, if we can buffer, I'm okay with letting go of the three quarter between each one. You know, I don't necessarily need to have a distance requirement between each MIP, but we need to, we do need to protect the youngest of ours. And whether we like it or not, they are impacted and influenced by so much more than what we can protect as parents. You've asked quite a bit. Let's move on to someone else that hasn't had much time to chance else? to talk. Genevieve, you've been on once. Let's hear. I just wanted one. to mention that we are adding one more item to the menu for kids. We've got tobacco, alcohol, and now we're adding marijuana. And think of the amount of money we spend right now on prevention of alcohol and tobacco. So I agree. This is the parents' influence. However, these are our future citizens, and are we helping them by making this product more available? And we don't know the future health impacts. Mr. Fitzgerald. We're, we're talking about manufacturing here, as Mr. Pond says. I think we, if you listen to the direction of this conversation, we've gotten off topic here. This is not about retail sales. It's not about medical marijuana sales. Um, there is, this is not retail at all. No signs on, on the outside advertising the product. No customers coming and going. Uh, the kids, there's absolutely no reason to believe that uh, this will have more effect on a, on a kid in school than a bolt manufacturing company would have. Uh, this, is, this is about a manufacturing plant. That's all it is. We don't, should barber shops be a thousand feet from each other for some reason? I'm going to take Mr. Starker, just because he hasn't said anything yet. Tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in the in the manufacture of these products in the in the in the MIPS, um, d does that um, how do they how do they typically deal with their waste products? Um, I can't necessarily um, answer that question. I think. It's a good question and maybe one that we would take back to the industry to see how they could answer that. So may have to get back to you on that question, but I think it is a good one. Is there any, is there any reason to believe that in the, in the manufacture of these products that they have much, any more or substantially more volatility than we would see in other types of light manufacturing or other uses that we would um, 
that we would approve in, approve in a C1 or a 1E zone? I'm not sure I'm set up to answer that question either, but I, I, I'm not aware of any um, byproducts that are, okay. for some reason, more do we, hazardous. Do we, do we think that the acquisition of the raw product and the way it's, the way it's transported over the, over the public right-of-way, I assume, and into the, into the facility, does that, do, do we think that would give rise, and, and Chief, maybe you would have, are we talking about a greater risk potentially for, a, for a, an event uh, to happen in, in the course of moving from uh, a distribution and sales operation to a manufacturing and wholesale operation? We certainly have not yet seen, seen an issue uh, uh, here. The issues that we have had have not been transportation related. Uh, they've, they've more been site related in terms of burglaries and, uh, uh, and, a, and a, at least a couple of robberies. So, um, you know, I don't have as much of a concern about that, but I mean, it's still an evolving field and, and uh, you know, there have been a couple of um, uh, documentaries on TV about the transportation of both product and cash and, and a lot of that is, is regulated by the state. Uh, so it's outside of our, our jurisdiction uh, and, and it's a highly you know, uh, uh, highly secure kind of transportation, both from a cash perspective and uh, a, a product perspective. Now, what that would look like, uh, uh, I'm not sure in terms of the manufacturing perspective. Uh, I think, as, as Ken uh, alluded to, I think having a discussion with, uh, you know, the businesses that, that would do this is, is probably key in terms of how much product they would have on site, uh, what, uh, what that manufacturing process might look like. Uh, you'll remember that one of the individuals wanted to, uh, to, to look at operating a MIP, talked about a CO2 extraction process. You know, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, the other extraction process that uh, Mr. DeTulo spoke about is the butane process where you heat it up with high temperatures and then uh, you run the risk of subsequent kinds of, of, of explosions. So I'm sure from a, from a manufacturing perspective, you know, that, you know, there's some standards out there in the industry and certainly you have some, you know, building safety and fire safety kinds of, mm -hmm. kinds of requirements. But, you know, it just continues to be an evolving field. So uh, like everybody else, I learn more and more every day, you know, in regards to the industry and what other jurisdictions are, are dealing with. And have you seen since we've uh, since we've had medical marijuana or or uh, retail marijuana in our in our community, any um, any correlation between uh, other other potentially more serious drugs, crack or heroin, or it does does there appear to be any correlation between the the use or the or disuse of those? A lot of that you'll uh, you know you'd have to relate to uh, you know the health drug studies that, that are being done. Uh, we, like the rest of the nation, uh, so it's not just Colorado, it's the rest of the nation have seen a pretty significant increase in, in heroin deaths. Uh, you know, our uh, drug awareness by, by students uh, is, is not where, I'm sorry, is not where it's been in the past. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you look at the uh, attitude studies as it pertains to drugs, and a lot of this could be parental influence or peer influence, seems to indicate that uh, you know, students don't view drugs uh, you know, to be a danger like they may have in the past. So there's a lot of, uh, both from a federal perspective and a state perspective and a local perspective, in my opinion, a lot of work that needs to be done from a, an education and prevention perspective that uh, uh, nobody's been doing for quite some time. Thank you. Uh, let me let me say something before we we have any more testimony. We'll call it that or discussion. It seems to me that the the questions that were what what we're trying to answer here is whether to uh, um, that in regard to manufacturing facilities, if we want the same sort of restrictions that we have on our our current being medical as as well as our retail, and it's not a question of whether we want. Uh, it's a, it's, the, the other question would be is do we want more of those, of, of manufacturing plants or, or stores, whatever, uh, centers in our city? We, we, have, we are receiving requests for more manufacturing type operations, and I think that's why these questions are before us and what this moratorium is about. So, and, and I realize that part of that is a question in our own minds as to whether in your minds as to whether we want to have more marijuana or whether we uh, 
we're looking at the good and bad of it as well. So I, I'd like to make sure that we get back to the question of do we want to, uh, if, if we remove the moratorium and, and no more manufacturing are allowed to come in, do we want to hold on to the regulations and make them the same as we have for um, the other two types of facilities which have, which are, of course, are medical, retail and grow. So let's kind of get back to that. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for recognizing me. And just as a point of order, I, I don't appreciate being ignored as, as you just did. Um, we as a council have a lot of questions on this. This is a very important issue. Well, let and me take issue with that. And I, and I did that because uh, so that everyone has a chance to speak, majority, minority. I think it's really important that if I so find someone who is first time asked to speak, that I will call them in, in lieu or in, in favor of someone who has spoken several times. And of course, then I'll come back to you and give you that chance. And, and, and that's perfectly fine, so long as you don't add the quip of you've already asked a lot of questions. I'm going to ask a thousand questions if I have to in order to make a proper de discussion. I apologize for the quip, and, and we both know the reasoning now. Thank you. Um, my question is, regarding other surrounding municipalities banning moratorium or otherwise uh, limiting the manufacturer sale retail the whole nine yards regarding uh, marijuana does that then put an extra pressure on land use and wheat ridge to be sort of bombarded by applications or interests in having marijuana manufacturing and would that uh, give us reason to want to have a sort of a separation requirement in order to in some ways limit the amount of manufacturing that could possibly take place or a simpler question would be, is there any analysis to how many, in the worst case scenario, or in the case of a manufacturer, in the best case scenario, what would the total amount of manufacturing and wheat which look like, or what, how many spots do we have available? For uh, standalone MIPS, um, you, you know, we, we certainly have, have received frequent phone calls, so there appears to be demand out there. and. And you, you know, accurately point out that some other communities are, are, are not as permissive as we are right now or, or flat out have a moratorium. So I think, yes, I mean, there's, there's demand out there, it would appear, for um, opening up these types of facilities. Uh, we are accommodating them right now in our, um, at least in our industrial uh, districts, and we have a number of those. So if there's no, you know, separation requirements, there's certainly additional opportunities um, to locate additional facilities. Well, that, I, that would just be something that I would be considering in my decision-making process as we go forward is understanding that if other municipalities directly neighboring us do not allow for this, and we do, then that automatically puts pressure. Um, so in Mr. Fitzgerald's uh, question about barbershops, if haircutting was outlawed in Arvada and Lakewood and we allowed it in Wheat Ridge, we might have an inordinate number of barbershops. So that's something to consider. Mr. DeTulio. So which two zone districts do we allow these in, industrial and commercial, or just industrial for the MIPS? Um, we, we clearly allow it in the IE, the Industrial Employment Zone District, and the C2, which is kind of a, a more commercial industrial uh, commercial district. In the C1 district, um, we allow some light manufacturing uses, so it, it could be permitted in, in certain uh, C1 zone districts. So we've already, in a way, we've already limited these to certain areas of the city by the by the zoning. I don't see us rezoning a neighborhood to industrial to allow MIPS. So I would think it'd be better to have them concentrated in one area than, than having them moving all over the, the city, especially if they're in the industrial zone districts. We don't have that many industrial zone districts or C2 right now. So it seems like having them concentrate in areas where we can monitor them and they can monitor themselves and be part of a, of a group of legal businesses would be better than having them a thousand feet apart and trying to get property rezoned for industrial commercial in the future to allow them. So. Carmen, um, could you confirm too, is J July 1st the date when um, the state law allows out-of-state out applicants applications to be accepted? Those who uh, don't currently have a medical um, license can begin to apply, yes, and their licenses would be effective October 1st. Ms. Wooden. I would like the discussion to, to not center on, but to consider 
if we are allowing it and we allow other businesses to come in and the surrounding communities have denied it and therefore I do believe it would push the businesses here is this what we want to be known for and it's not about any kind of business this isn't a barber shop it's manufacturing a drug now it is a recreational drug but it's manufacturing a drug and Jefferson County an entire county has put together a task force and they've put together the negative consequences which could be impaired driving increased accidents um, impact on youth not on only on their mental health um, but on their ability to stay in school gang involvement property decline values so do we want to use our budget our Wheat Ridge budget offsetting these these negative consequences do we want our police out there working on these issues that are going to come up from the product itself it's not just a manufacturing issue it's an issue about what the substance can potentially do to a community there she is <laughs> <laughs> I hope I have a solution, but I, I'm, I don't know if I will. You certainly have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why I did it like that, but <laughs> you know, I have one of those wallflowers. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I do listen to everyone um, and their points. I think people do have a lot of valid points when we have all the cities around us saying no. I don't want to be, has anyone gone on the other side of Sheridan on 38th, that it's, you know, marijuana shop after marijuana shop after marijuana shop. Right off of 6th Avenue, if you drive by like 6th Avenue, um, I-25, if you take a big whiff, because there's a ton of growth sites over there. I, I do think it is something to be cautious of, and I would rather be a bit more cautious now and back up then kind of be like come one come all um so i would like to set up the same requirements that we have um and and i guess the one question is is this would be excluding the one pending mip that we had right but i would like to set up the same requirements that we have for the other sites just and it's to me it's not about uh because it's retail or because it's a um it's not retail and our students aren't going to see it. I think it's more because I don't want our whole industrial areas to become, you know, I could kid around. I just kind of whispered to Bud that we are the carnation capital. I don't know that I want to, um, you know, become the marijuana capital because everybody around us has said no. So I would like to make a motion to maybe have the same um, requirements as we do the others. Mr. Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Can we have C1 zone on this map that was provided in our packet and the 1E zone, but we're talking about, um, about possibly C2 zoning. And, and let me interrupt you, Bud, because I, I have to apologize. I, I, what I stated earlier, and I was going to correct this at the appropriate time, but we don't allow it in the C2 districts. Uh, we only went with the C1 and the IE, and I think the rationale for that was we have so little C2 anyways, it's really kind of a moot point. Okay. So it, it's only the C1 and the IE that okay. we've allowed various types of marijuana-related uses thus far. Let me ask you, what are the typical characteristics in a, of, a, of a business in a C1 district? Uh, they really run the gamut. I mean, I think you, C1 is very prevalent in the city. I mean, it's probably our most prevalent uh, commercial zone district. So, uh, you know, previously you saw a lot of it on... Wadsworth and 38th before we rezoned most of those corridors to the mixed use designations. But you still see uh, it's very common on uh, 44th Avenue, um, on Kipling. Uh, it's a very common zone but district. But that type of so zone. So it's a real mixed restaurant. That type of zone district is typically used, if I, if uh, my belief in it is, is for retail, retail and customer and merchant interaction. Is that correct? Where you go into a store, you go into a grocery store, and you and you buy groceries. That's in a C1 district. You go into a hair salon to have a to have a a service provided to you. That's in a C1 district. You go to an automotive store, uh, per perhaps to buy an automobile, and you exchange. Uh, uh, commerce in a C1 district. Is that is that typically what a C1 is? I'd say that's an accurate characterization. Yes. Okay, 
and typically in an IE, that's an industrial employment zone, uh, that's typically where you would have sort of manufacturing, light manufacturing, where you would be sort of a wholesaler, and you're not really catering to a retail walk-in trade. Is that correct? Yes. And I guess when I look at, thank you, and I guess when I sort of look at the use or at the, at the type of business that, uh, that MIPS are, to me, they're more similar to a light industrial or an industrial type of use. Um, I guess I'm not sure why we would co-mingle those necessarily with, with a general commercial zone district. Um, from a couple of standpoints, I'm, I, I kind of uh, am with Ms. Davis in that I don't want to see uh, Wheat Ridge become the marijuana capital of the world. Um, by the same token, I'm not ready to shut down the business because the citizens of the state voted for it. I think it's our responsibility to deal with it and, and provide the enabling or the, the actualizing legislation that makes it a, a responsible business and that we, we regulate it responsibly within our community. But to me, um, and I also, the other half of that is that C1, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, C1 is all sort of the best, uh, uh, I would think the best retail presence that we want, and I hate to see back end and back room operations taking what could be valuable storefront, uh, you know, retail space where you could have barbers and and uh, restaurants and and other other types of establishment, and and to the extent that we allow those in our commercial districts, we're going to go on our premier streets. I mean, they happen on 44th and on 38th and on Kipling and Wadsworth and in those types of areas. Um, I think we're doing a disservice to our general uh, commercial partners, if you will, to, um, to sort of open up that real estate to manufacturing. So I, I, I would be sort of in favor of, um, of sort of if, if we were to move forward to limit it to a 1E zone. And in terms of just to, just to sort of finish where I'm at on this thing, uh, I, think, I think we should, and, and I think it's appropriate that we provide sort of continuity and predictability in our, in our codes and stuff. And so if we had the same distance requirements for these types of facilities that we have, and, and we sort of could say, well, we regulate, you know, uh, uh, medical marijuana and retail marijuana and, marijuana and, and medically infused products, and we did not include the the testing laboratory under the moratorium, but I assume that we're, uh, or may, uh, adopt regulations that would, uh, that would apply to those types of businesses, whether or not they're under the moratorium or not. And that may be another issue because um, laboratories, um, you know, I, what, again, what are op office parks? How do, we, how do we typically classify those? Are they C1 properties typically, or? That'd be uh, certainly common, yeah. Um, some of them are, some of our office parks, to the extent that we, we have, you know, we don't have real big office parks necessarily, but um, a lot of those would be zoned PCD, Planned Commercial District. Okay. And our opinion has been, and our determination has been that uh, unless it's a PCD and there's one pending, uh, that actually specific calls out marijuana related businesses um, from the, the you know the range of those types of businesses that it's not permitted so unless it's listed then of course it's not typically because no one knew this was going to be here when right. those pcds were adopted uh, then our interpretation is that it's not allowed mr Zutulio. so uh, piggybacking on what mr starker has said we have mips right now in c1 correct I know, we, I know at least one or two that are in C1 we do. right now. So if we were to ban them in C1 zone districts for MIPS, that would indicate that they're illegally non-conforming use. They could stay forever as long as they sell within six months, and, and then they, re, they have a new owner. It's that legally non-conforming situation. So the MIPS that are here in commercial are going to stay as long as they sell to a person within six months and they open up that business, they can, they can continue to operate. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So what you're suggesting is that we would create legally non-conforming uses in the C1 and then allow them in the industrial IE as a, as a specified use and then still have a thousand dollar or a thousand foot limit on uh, them within the industrial? That would, that would sort of be my proposal, yes. And, you know, I mean, if, if we have some that are grandfathered in, they're grandfathered in, you know, we, we can't deal with on that. The, on the C1s. 
and Mr. Fitzgerald. I, I certainly would uh, agree with limiting uh, infusion product manufacturing to industrial zones. I'm good with that. Uh, I still don't see the logic in the thousand foot limit. Uh, it's just a manufacturing business like any other. And if um, we think that we're going to change Mar the existence of marijuana, we're not. Um, it's here and it's going to be here. And if we don't uh, regulate it, uh, then it will, it will just go on anyway without us. So the only possible reason to have a 1,000 foot limit is to show your displeasure with marijuana in general. And I don't, don't really see that. So I agree with the, the uh, re restricting this to the IE zone, but I don't agree with the 1,000 foot limit. Uh, yeah, Ms. Langworthy over here. Thank you, okay. George. I think, I mean, I, I'm actually glad to hear that, because industrial, you don't generally have schools near industrial, and my biggest, you know, is whether we like it or not, kids know more than we think they know, and just because it isn't advertised as a sale point, they know more than we'd like them to know. And if they drive by it all the time, it does stick in their head. I mean, I'm amazed constantly what, what children can come up to me and tell me. So to, to say that they don't get impacted by it, I don't believe it's true. But if you're looking at the IE zones, there's only one school that falls within that, that kind of thousand foot range. And currently what butts up to the school is an RV, uh, RV sales place. So, I mean, I would be even okay with a thousand because it really only impacts a very small area of IE and the likelihood of, of a MIP going in that one is, you know, it, it kind of still provides that buffer for the school, but it's not a giant portion and it's not going to impact a lot of the IE area. And Mr. Pond? Um, I also would be okay with the uh, uh, IE designation and the exclusion of the C1. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the thousand foot distance, but looking at the map, it's not really, it's not, it doesn't really come into play all that much. But to be clear, because uh, it hasn't been stated clearly, although I could infer by Mr. Starker's comments, um, I would not support the three-quarter mile uh, separation. Um, it, so uh, that I would not, um, I would not do. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really prefer the thousand foot distance, but I don't think it's really, from a land use standpoint, I, I don't think it's, it's that much of an issue. I think we've, I think we've had pretty good discussion on this. Um, well, I would, I would agree with the IE zone district, but I wouldn't agree with the thousand feet either. So I, th I think if you're going to take consensus, you sp should split those out. Zoning piece. Start with the zoning question first, maybe. I mean, uh, exclude. Yes, excludes excludes C1 for for MIPS. Just right. allow them only in IE. Is that you don't think we can do it all in one? I don't think so. All right. <laughs> no, doesn't sound like enough. All right, um, are we ready for, the, for at least that much of the question? Which it would be, all right, could I get a, uh, I guess Consen I need. Consensus, I believe, is, or the question on the table is to exclude um, uh, C1, MIPS in, in the C1 district, allow them only in the IE zoning districts. Okay, we have a consensus of yes on that, and um, that which, which makes it carry. And the next question then would be? Since you're, it's the distance requirement. Sorry, distance ahead, requirement. But we have two distance requirements actually. Can we can we speak to that for a minute? Since Absolutely. we haven't really done that, I, I guess I'm I'm more concerned with um, the distance maybe between these uh, MIP manufacturers. What what I kind of hate to see is is someone uh, sort of develop a, a, a MIP business park. Mm -hmm. You know. So that so that it's we've we've set this up for your for your business. We've got heavy heavy electrical, heavy HVAC, uh, heavy uh, all of this. Um, you know, we're building a building to uh, to support the medical marijuana industry, and we we can do that because we haven't made any regulations distance from one to another. Now, maybe maybe there's a. a 
a desire to have that type of facility in our community. To <laughs> yes, but we're not the industrials. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's move on to that question. Um, could I get a consensus on uh, retaining the, is it the three quarter mile distance between medical manufacturing facilities? Uh, could I get a consensus of, of, on that, uh, that you are in favor of that? A question on that. Where does the three-quarter mile originate? Is that between ma manufacturers? Yeah, I, 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 I know, but why? Why is it five eighths of a mile or half a mile or? That's, that that coincides. Right, but if the question is why we applied it to the retail initially, what? I mean, you, you where where it originally where came where from? Does the, where does the mile? I think it came from another jurisdiction that it used it. I mean, it, we. We can, we can change, choose anything we, we want. We can change it to a smaller okay. distance. Okay. Okay, so now I think we need to state. Yeah. I think there's some uh, distinction there that we need to make as far as whether it's distance between two manufacturing facilities or distance between manufacturing and retail mm -hmm. or manufacturing and testing. I mean, is it ma manufacturing and everything right. or is it manufacturing and manufacturing? Got it. All right, we, we have to dig down a little further, in other words. So what I need is a statement about whether our distance applies to all of the possible marijuana facilities, be that growing or selling or, or manufacturing or testing. Or testing. Right. Um, what distance? Medical or retail. Medical or retail. We already have medical and retail. Yeah. So this is really between our question tonight is about manufacturing. This, the, there's, there's no commonality. They're different animals uh, between retail and medical and MIPS right. and kitchens. So we should, this should be, should, uh, should a MIP manufacturing facility be 1,000 feet from another MIP manufacturing facility? Three quarter mile is the. Or some yeah. distance. Today it's, it's, for the other uses, it's three quarter Three quarters a mile between other like uses. Like to like, right? Like so to retail like. to retail, medical uh, center, medical sales center to medical sales center. So like to like is the three quarter mile, as Mr. Fitzgerald was suggesting. I, I have a question on that. If a new retail establishment or a medical establishment seeks an application, the, does the position or location of a manufacturing facility impact their three quarter mile requirement? No. Like to like. Like to like. Okay. Could I get someone to make a consensus on that or a, a suggestion that? Madam Mayor, I'd make a consensus not to have a three quarter mile standard. Or no, 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 no separation. Separation. no separation is what your consensus is. Show of hands on that. All right. May I have a consensus on a certain distance? I'll make a consensus for a quarter mile. Oh, let's not <laughs> go. We're going to go quarter it up. No, quarter mile. Quarter All right, mile. quarter mile. So we look like we have a consensus of one, two, three, four, five for a separation of one quarter mile between medical manufacturers. Like to like. To mip like to, to like, right. Quarter mile. Mip quarter mile. To mip. mip to mip. All right, that's our consensus. Cover the thousand yes. high schools. Yes. We do. I'd make a consensus. I mean, it only impacts one school, but it's, it's still an impact. So I, I would make a consensus that we still keep the 1,000 foot, 1, foot distance around schools. Um, I, and I would say schools, at least schools and daycare. Um, you leave it all the same? OK. I was trying really to complicate yeah. it. If yeah. okay, well then I'll just say a thousand foot per per current standards. Schools, drug treatment facilities, daycares, and college campuses. All right, we have a consensus on that. Can I have a show of hands as to agreeing with that consensus? Uh, one one question. Sure. Does that impact d uh, like locations like, like that? No, hold it. It's. Let's say that there's a school in Arvada n near our industrial area. Does that impact that since that's a school in Arvada or 
does that not count because it's in Arvada? It does count. Okay. But I don't think there's a school within a thousand feet. The closest one is a uh, in Arvada that I know of is um, north of I-70. So oh, I-70 might not be. But it's I-70 in Wadsworth, and it's not. I mean, it's not. I mean, looking at the map, it, there, I'm not aware of a school that falls within a thousand feet of our industrial. Well, the uh, you would have uh, the Faith Bible Chapel campus. But it's the highway is in between. That does doesn't matter. A thousand feet is a thousand feet. A thousand feet is a crow flies. Is a thousand feet a thousand feet, or is it as you walk, or is the crow flies? It's as you walk. As you walk. Thank you. The, the quarter mile, I assume, is as the crow flies. Correct. So they could be across I-70, and that would be okay then? Well, with I-70 as a barrier, you know, the walking distance is going to be fairly circuitous, generally speaking. I mean, it's hard to answer in the hypothetical, right? But um, but I th that thousand feet gets eaten up fairly quickly when you're trying to find a route across I-70. I'm just trying to think globally. So the consensus is thousand feet for the same. Or yeah, I mean the question on the table. So and, just and just to be clear, it's just yep. schools, drug treatment facilities, daycares, and college campuses. Right. Is what's in our current code for the other uses. Please raise your hand if you agree with that. One, two, three, four. Okay. Oh, I saw three. No, I've got four right here. Oh, okay. Four. Support of four. It's so it fails, unless I get to vote, and I agree with it. I agree with that consensus. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Can we move on then? Um, Yeah, that's really one through four. Um, the other the other questions have to do with the odor, odor issues. Um, that's question number five, and there's a attachment two to your memo is a memo from um, our chief building official, who um, has some more information on odor and, and Ken could probably give you a little more information. Well, I on think that. the the quick answer is the technology is there. Uh, to be able to add ventilation enhancements, certain uh, types of scrubbing uh, machinery, so that the the odors that are um, emitted from these facilities or from the processing uh, activities associated with the, the facilities in the case of MIPS uh, could be reduced. I think, as with anything, it's probably um, not possible to totally eliminate it or, or necessarily to create a threshold that would say you know, there shall be no visible evidence or odor off-site or something like that. I'm not sure we could get that aggressive, but I think we could uh, make amendments to our, our building code that would improve uh, the ability, uh, reduce the ability to smell it off-site. Mr. Pond. I think you probably answered this in your, in your statement, but what, so what, you, what this uh, contemplates then is you coming back specifically with amendments to the, to the uh, building codes such that someone coming in um, with a building, um, uh, you know, uh, a application for construction for one, of these, for one of these manufacturing facilities in an approved location, um, would have to be bound by those additional code um, restrictions specifically to probably uh, HVAC or mechanical systems uh, and what they would have to put in place in order to to comply with with that so it would be a front end piece it sounds like you would kind of go through plan review and catch that in your in your uh, review of the plans and it doesn't necessarily contemplate something on the back end that's anything more than our current odor ordinances or if, if and I, I guess I would ask w what ordinances do we have on odor on the on the back end I just want to make sure I understand that right uh, I mean I think the only um Yes, to your question, it would be front end specifically applied to marijuana related businesses that we would presumably catch during our plan review process in terms of those stricter uh, requirements. Um, you know, the, the odor um, enforcement that we have right now um, is, is strictly, you know, to the extent that it would rise to the level of being a nuisance. Um, I'm not sure, and, and jump in here, either Dan or Carmen, but 
Um, I'm not sure that we've, at this, to this point, um, seen a situation that we felt has risen to that level where we've pursued a citation. Um, so I think that's what we have under the existing regulations. I would make one, and if, if there's a, a notion to consider a consensus on this topic, I would um, maybe pose one additional question, which is, and, and again, Carmen, jump in here, but in my brief conversations with um, other, other staff on this topic, I think this is one of those operational uh, requirements that we could actually make retroactive in some sort of a reasonable way so that for existing facilities, um, if we wanted to give them a compliance period of, of six months or, you know, you pick the number, uh, that that would be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, I'm s oh, well, go ahead, get, go ahead and get both. I was going to make right, a consensus. Mr. Starker, then. I, I, I had a question. Have we, have we altered our, or, or talked about in our building code, a new uh, dealt with the occupancy issue relative to, to uh, marijuana in any form? Or are we using the codes that, as they came down, that didn't address this issue? Yes, we're just using existing, in terms of residential occupancy or commercial? Well, in terms of, uh, you know, I, well, someone comes in and says, I wanna, you know, um, have, make medical, mar medical infused products and marijuana, and you're gonna put him into a, you're gonna call that a certain occupancy in yeah. the code, and the code doesn't deal with that. Well, it, it deals with manufacturing uses, so we've we've classified them as a manufacturing. Okay, use. so you're you're doing it. To, so nothing nothing particularly relative to marijuana, and from a from a code enforcement and a code development and a legal perspective, is that something that we should deal with? I, I think it's a, a good question, um, and I'm not familiar enough with the details of the building code to know how specific those descriptions of uh, are of manufacturing uses. You know, if they if they get to the point of of you know describing particular materials that are used in different act well, and I guess what I'm getting at is, do we have the do we have the appropriate tools so that our building official can look at a at a use that's coming in because we have a new use in the marketplace, and and um, so that so that he he or she has the tools to classify that appropriately in the building code and therefore be able to overlay the regulations that go with that. And, I, I, and, I and we can take a look at that. I guess that's just sort of as a form of discussion and maybe something to look at. Okay. Mr. Dottolio. So, you know, mine, I'm going to try to make a consensus here so we can keep going. I like to make a consensus to direct staff to move forward with considering additional regulations that would reduce or minimize the odors associated with marijuana related products and production. And that would also be a retroactive pr procedure uh, up to six months, as you mentioned. And that to come back to council for as an ordinance. Retroactive in the fact that they would have six months to okay. comply. Yep. Comply. That's my consensus. That's your consensus. Um, did my, you want to? My question on that is you, you defined it as production. So does that not include the retail sale or the medical sale of the same in those facilities? I, I think we're just discussing manufacturing. Okay. Well, uh, I don't think so. I think and growing all, and growing. All li license types. It was it all? Yeah. All license all. types. Yeah, that's fine. All but right. You, you, but it's, Either well, way, Jerry, Jerry had said production well, of. Well, it says yeah. products and production. So products, I mean, retailer yeah. and medical are selling products. Yeah. So is the 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 consensus all encompassing then, as far as all? They and can make it very retroactive. They give them six months to comply. Right. Okay. And then bring it back as an ordinance. Do I have a consensus on that, Mr. Are we raising hands on that? All right, good. Then we have, and mm -hmm. are you comfortable with it? Yep, no, okay. I, yep, we've got direction on that, thank okay. you. Okay, um, can we move on to number six, it looks like? Yeah, item six has to do with um, the growing as a primary caregiver and uh, the amount of space. Whoops, sorry, George, you have a oh, question? No. Oh, okay, um, Ken, Ken can give you a quick. Oh, do we need an explana explanation of this, or uh, you got it? really like hearing from Ken, but I'm I okay. Right now. Absolutely fine. <laughs> I, I just I want to su support this, and uh, and I certainly I had the privilege of being on the planning commission when some of these things were discussed in the original ordinances, and I do think this is really a, a something that we need to be careful about in terms of how people are. Um, 
using and modifying their 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 homes and their and their structures and their electrical systems and their everything else uh, systems as as it relates to 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 these uh, conversions for this type of of uh, of, of growing etc. And I think the that we should we should absolutely get the get the uh, um, get in line with what we said for the medical marijuana ordinance. And I recall that the issue really was about safety and making sure that that people um you know were uh t certainly taking advantage of 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 the right by 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 state law but were being held to account as to how to uh you know to be safe about how they're using their home and or and or uh buildings and the systems so i i think we should absolutely do this thank you um do i have any questions on that or further discussion so I, I agree that uh, this should be tightened up. Would this be enforced by code enforcement or by the building official? And when do we go in to check this? Would this be a proactive inspection? If we see medical or we see plants are growing in a yard, are we going to knock on the door and say, can we look at your grow facility? Or are we going to wait till someone calls in? Or what's the enforcement process? Can't grow them in the yard, first of all. <laughs> well, growing, okay, if, yeah. we see some, we, if we see a property, a residential property, through the window, I, I understand that, so bear with me here. If, we're, if we see a grow facility in a residential area, can we proactively inspect it, or are we going to wait till we get a complaint? It could be both. Um, you know, certainly uh, uh, those kinds of complaints can happen, uh, or those kinds of issues can come up in a number of different ways. It could be a, uh, a, a lawful uh, contact by a, by a law enforcement officer or a building code official in regards to, to an inspection process. Uh, certainly these kinds of things, uh, unless it's something that's really significant and a major distribution kind of thing, aren't gonna result in immediate arrests. Uh, right now when we deal with these kinds of situations, uh, it's a collaborative kind of uh, approach between, it could be code enforcement, it could be the police officer, it could be the building code official, uh, it could be uh, human, uh, uh, you know, our uh, uh, social services, you know, uh, seeing something, uh, you know, that, that needs to be dealt with and addressed. It can happen a variety of different ways. If somebody doesn't want to allow us to, to make an entry, then obviously, you know, the Fourth Amendment rights apply and we have to have, you know, probable cause for a warrant and, and, a, and a search. So what you're saying is that this can be enforced. It's not one dimensional. We can enforce this in different ways, code enforcement, police department, social services. Whatever building code, whatever I mean, it's, comes in. it okay. can come to our attention a variety of different ways, just like it does today. I mean, you know, nothing would really change. This was my concern, especially if they're using butane for hash oil. So I agree with Mr. Pond that we should move forward with tightening this up and cleaning up our code. So. Mr. Fitzgerald. I agree that we should clean this up. 25% is a lot of space. I think we should, def we should also include basements and attics and garages when we talk about this. Um, the, the one question I have is I don't really know what the distinction between personal consumption and primary caregiver is. Um, because I know that, a, isn't it true that a personal consumption only has six plants or something like that? Isn't that Personal true? consumption is limited to uh, six plants, three mature, three immature plants, and uh, an ounce of, of product. So it, and what about a primary or a primary caregiver? Well, primary caregiver is is medical based, so this that is on the medical marijuana uh, side of, of the equation, and so uh, a primary caregiver uh, is is limited to to six plants for every patient that they they have. So if if I've got three patients, then you know I can have 18 plants unless a doctor has written a prescription for a particular patient that says that that patient uh, needs more plants. Uh, than than the uh, six that are required by law. So I mean, we've dealt with That's some those, we've dealt with some situations those. with three patients and over 200 plants. So there's there's a lot of interaction that goes on between law enforcement and the Department of Public Health, you know, in regards to to the validity validity of those kinds of requests. So uh, state yeah state law allows for an exemption for the from the medical side, you know, for more than than six plants. From the, from the recreational side, you're limited to, to your plants and your product. 
So the only thing we're talking about here is for personal consumption. Yes. Is that true? Correct. Yeah, we have regulations already in place. For and the there's medical already use. Is this already a requirement of six plants. So 25% is way too big for that, probably. If I could just elaborate, um, the, the, the reason for the 25% is that when we adopted the medical marijuana ordinance initially, uh, we thought there was a, a logic to the fact that a primary caregiver, whether or not they're, op they're, they're operating for profit, really is akin to a home occupation, right? That it's occupying a portion of the structure for a significant activity that's, that's not residential in character. Uh, and our ordinances already, at the time, you know, allowed for home occupations under certain restrictions, and there's, there's quite a bit of, of language there. So we thought it was just appropriate to mirror that kind of approach to say, hey, if you're a primary caregiver, you're a home occupation, and we're going to regulate you that, that way. So we thought it was a logical extension to say, well, if, if someone's growing for personal consumption, that um, it, it's akin to you know, a hobby, a home occupation of sorts. Again, not necessarily for profit or not for profit, presumably. Um, but that, that was the reason for the logic is of, of using the 25%. Mr. Starker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in this, is this where, if we, if we so desired, that we would address home manufacturing of MIPS? Yeah, I mean, I think um, under the constitutional amendments and the state laws that have been adopted, you would be permitted to do that type of an activity. Um, well, you're, you're entitled to possess it, right? Are you entitled to manufacture it? That's good, too. That's the butane guys. Okay. Um, are, are we able to provide uh, either through our, uh, an ordinance affecting the, what we're talking about here or through our building code? I'm concerned that we're, that we're creating uh, a hazardous condition with homemade manufacturing. How, how, is, how best should we address that question? It's, it seems like a bit of a challenging one, uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, I think we, we may have to talk about it internally some, but, you know, to, to apply kind of more restrictive codes on that type of activity uh, beyond just normal kind of safety codes of, you know, creating a dangerous, hazardous situation, um, which already are on the books. You know, someone could be cited for that. But, but to kind of add some additional layer that applies to this, I mean, it'd just be... I kind of question the, the ability to support that from a constitutional standpoint of, you know, they're entitled to do this. And if we, you know, make it, if we treat it as like a commercial occupancy or something like that, uh, that makes it impractical for them to be able to do it. I'm not sure, you know, whether our attorneys would agree that that was a good approach. Uh, just as a follow-up, I, you know, I, I appreciate those concerns and I don't know the answer. I guess what I would, what I would ask, bless you is for staff to maybe take a look at that question and um, you know I can't uh, I don't know the I don't know the building codes and, and the other codes that well to be able to say well here's a convenient place where we we talk about home safety and and uh, you know fire safety and those types of things but and I'm not sure how we you know sort of regulate um, other fire producing you know welding and torches and other things that that may be a hazard, and I guess all I do, uh, I guess my own, my closing thought is if, if you can go back and, and consider it and if there's a way that we can, that we can sort of tighten up our regulations so we're not uh, fostering a, 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 a health and safety problem. And just keep in mind, it would be illegal um, if they were producing enough quantity to be selling it if they didn't have a license, so um, we do have obviously regulations on the book to handle those, but Mr. Urban. Thank you. Um, I, I definitely see a distinction between growing marijuana for personal consumption and growing marijuana as, as a primary caregiver. And I don't think that growing marijuana for personal consumption would necessarily fit into the home occupation or hobby status in the sense that it just like other types of gardening aren't necessarily classified as such. And in this case, I don't know that we can um, dictate too much in the sense that this is a person's residence, their domicile, this is where they reside. And just from a constitutional perspective, taking out the question of marijuana, I'd be very cautious about telling people what to do 
inside their home. If they're stupid enough to burn down their house, you know, that's sort of a, I don't think that, I, I, I want people to be safe and I want the neighborhoods to be safe, but uh, I don't know if we can, how far we can go as far as dictating, since the Constitution allows them to grow that, how far we can go in, in dictating to them how they can do that. Well, sure. But, but that's the thing, is that they're already breaking the law. I would assume that you would need a larger quantity than is allowed to be grown in order to begin manufacturing or production, I, I'm assuming. But I don't know. Is this question more about, um, since it's growing, or um, limitations for personal use? And, and the, the limitations are there not only because we, we don't want them using, growing it for, for sale of. Is, is it another way of putting a kind of a rule in there, I'm getting an aha from Carmen? Well, I think there's two considerations. One is, is limiting the, you know, trying to limit the size of, right. of the grow so that they don't grow more than what they're allowed to by law. Law does allow them to possess up to an ounce of product. So if they want to make an ounce of hash oil, and that's what they're possessing. You know, you know, they can do that. I think the other the other issue is 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 sort of that we're sort of dancing around here is a safety issue, and and so that safety issue looks uh, looks differently in a lot of different ways from from making hash oil. Uh, it could be a mold issue. We dealt with that the other day on a, on a, on a child abuse case that uh, uh, where where the room where the child was kept had a tremendous amount of of mold in it from a marijuana grow that was downstairs. Now there are some ways that we can deal with that. We can look at that from a situation of a child neglect, you know, child abuse. We can look at it from the situation of a safety perspective to see if they've done any alterations to, to the electrical or HVAC or lighting, you know, that would cause that, to, you know, to happen. And much the same situation that we talked about earlier. Those would have to be, you know, lawful justifiable entries and plain view kinds of situations where, where you'd observe that. Uh, what we have seen uh, in, in in, in unlawful kinds of grows, and this is this is where this would would sort of uh, you know give give a little bit of, of, of teeth to, to the situation is is we do see and, and have seen in, in, in several situations where people are growing more than what they're supposed to be growing. So this this sort of puts puts it out there that you're really limited in ter in terms of the scope of your grow, uh, in terms of what you can do. Certainly, if they're growing more than they they're supposed to. We've got some other, uh, you know, laws that we can we can use to address that, but for you know the general citizen out there, you know that that, that wants their own, you know, personal, uh, you know, uh, marijuana, it, it does put a limitation around that, and it, and it needs to be a reasonable limitation. But I think from from the safety issues, whether it's mold or electrical or HVAC or whatever it might be, you know, council might want to consider some reasonable, you know, safety. Uh, ordinances around that so people know what they can do and what they can't do. And I guess that my point on that is that, that those discussions and those regulations to me would be separate and different from primary caregiver and home occupations that it's not a home occupation in that sense it's a personal consumption. I believe that's correct. That's what I'm hearing. Mr. Tertullio. So uh, I'd like to try to, uh, for consensus on this, to see if people are interested in moving forward. I would like to propose a staff, direct staff, to go ahead and bring forth some limitations and some safety issues towards to council in an ordinance addressing safety and home occupancy and the uh, personal grow, and to take a shot at it and bring back a, an ordinance for council to look at. Maybe that should come back to a study session, but I'd like to move forward with item six in a positive way and have staff come back with some recommendations. Are you proposing that we separate any of this? Uh, because it looks like there are three, there are actually three issues here. Well, I think I'd like to see them look at each three and then maybe they make a recommendation on, on splitting this out or, or making proposals based on personal caregiver versus, versus a personal grow. And then you be, bring back some ideas and see what we can come up with. Because I don't really know where to, to draw the line on this right now. You might know better than I do. I, I think do. that's what they're asking. Staff is asking permission to um, yes. more sp make more specific limitations. No, I'm not bring so all we have to do is say, yes, we agree with, with this uh, number six. Hands, good. Do, it, do we, is that clear now? That Ken, is that, do you want a little more clear? <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we have an approach. We've actually drafted. Um, we just hadn't got it in front of you guys yet. So I think 
um, in the spirit of not reinventing the, the wheel, we'll, bring, we'll bring you that approach. Now, uh, out of reach. <laughs> yep. Okay, let's move on to number seven. Total ban on additional marijuana related business should be considered. Such an approach is permissible under state law. Is that the direction city council wants to pursue? Mr. Urban. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, Ms. Wooden's uh, perspective on this and where she's coming from on this. And I think that the detrimental effect of this would be to sort of create an artificial monopoly for those currently operating. And I don't believe we can direct those currently operating to cease operations uh, without a significant amount of li liability from them. Um, I don't see, uh, w can staff walk us through a situation where we as a city could back out of those at, I at think the, the time? question is additional. Right, but if you, li if you don't allow any more to come in, then the current businesses aren't gonna have a problem with that because that just means more business for them. It just it cr sort of creates okay. an artificial monopoly, and I would be concerned about that. Um, and just from a, a, a business perspective, um, if you've already allowed some, that we need to be mindful of the detrimental effects of stopping it from occurring in the future. I think examples um, in the past, um, we've put uh, moratoriums or we banned, um, tet let's see, psychic readers at one point in the city, and I, I think any, any um, current psychic readers who were allowed to stay, but I don't They I didn't think, see that coming? Yeah, no, I don't think they did. I think that was a question to them. That was a question to them. Um, I think that's the only, in my history, that's the only, Jerry, you might remember too, I think that might be the only one. But they are still, they're still legally non-conforming uses. They can if they sell stay. and sell and sell. So I think council's already discussed this in, at nauseum last term that this was a policy they were going to allow, and I've been told in the past we don't want to rehash things that have been discussed. But I think that passing a moratorium now is just a waste of time. Ms. Davis, I think the other point from when we had the map with all the circles on it, I don't think there's many more places that they could go because of the distance requirements and that kind of thing. So um, I think it's kind of set that there won't be many. Could I suggest a consensus then that we just say no to this? Yes, you can. Just say no to seven. All right. No to seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can move on to number eight now. Can I, oh, do, you, do, do you want to talk about that or can I say something? I have a question first. What, how often would we know what these amounts are as far as the tax revenues, permit fees, et cetera, and, and how much is it? Do we, even, I mean, do we have any amounts right now? We do. We started tracking those individually. Um, I can tell you in, in 2000, what year is it today? 14. 2013, um, we brought in uh, just right at $100,000 in um, sales tax. Um, that doesn't include any fees. Um, it's, it's ramped up slowly since um, 2009 or 8 when this first started, and uh, uh, 2013 was the largest year, and I think we're on track to, to beat that this year. Okay, I, what I'm suggesting here in this is that when the public voted on this, we were told some of it was going to go to certain applications, and I think if we are one of the few cities around here that's going to allow it, then we as a council should look at these funds and how they should be used. And uh, since we're going to be losing the grant money for one of our senior our school resource officers, I think some of the, these funds should be set up so that they're going to help our community. I agree. And, uh, and replacing the funds for a school resource officer would be one area. I don't know if parks are another area. And I also don't know, I, I originally thought schools, but schools rejected gambling money. Do the schools want drug money? I don't know. So I think I, what I'm asking is um, can council look at those funds and decide how to allocate it effectively to our community. Yeah, you can, yep. if that's a question, yeah, you, def that you have that authority to, to earmark those funds. Uh, I wanted to 
say uh, this is a great idea because when I first saw this, I heard it on the study session. I thought you were proposing we would take a check and give it to Leverage High School, a check to give it to Gilmore Davis. But I know the grant is running out for the SROs, and if we could allocate this funding or a portion of it to pay for the three SROs of school resource officers, that's a great idea. And I think that um, that would be great if we could allocate some of that funding for the school resource officers as we come through the budget process for 2015, I guess, to start allocating those funds. So I agree with that in, in an effort of compromise. I, I agree 110. And, and I feel like it doesn't have to be specifically for schools because I'm saying I don't know that the schools is going to want it. But that we as council decide what areas in the city would benefit, you know, from this and maybe it would be the historical society I don't know but that council will decide how these spe specific funds could be allocated and you, you know that's something you could do during the budget process also um, it wouldn't have to be a decision to make exactly where it goes tonight and we could have um, better numbers of, of what 2014 um, will look like so you know how much you can spend next year um, as it relates to the the cost to the city to administer this and the financial impact on the city because of uh, these businesses, I would like to see a little bit better sort of estimation or analysis or accounting as to the total impact on the city. Um, as, a, uh, as we look at fees specifically, fees should be related to the costs involved in administrating that. Correct. And I'd like to separate the fees item away from the tax issue because I think it would be easier to allocate the, the tax revenue as opposed to the fees because the fees should be the cost of the city administrating that license uh, schedule, whatever that may be. Right. And that's how we set our fees. We, we did an analysis on how much um, police time and, and sales tax and community development time it takes to review the permits and applications and that's how we set our fees. Mr. Pond. Uh, I'd agree with uh, Mr. Urban's comment on that because I do recall the fee structure and of course I think we should be looking at that on an ongoing basis. Um, so we estimated that but I would hope that in the next budget cycle that we're going to get a report from the police department and other, other kind of departments within the organization that are going to be able to estimate whether or not the, the fee structure is still compensating for what our our work what your work is actually and certainly we've just added some with the building department um, tonight or will in the next few weeks and that needs to be taken into account as well if code review uh, and plan review is going to take you know take longer etc um, I, I don't have um, a problem saying that we should should do this I do think though that really understanding where the resources are net are, are needed uh, certainly the um, SROs I think meet a lot of the uh, criteria that we've talked about tonight and that would be great so I do support that um, I do have a question though I d as it relates to schools because I do still think at a state level there is money that's going to, to schools is that correct or is that just Denver what's the policy from us from a statewide standpoint as to funds you know the governor has um, uh, issued a, uh, <coughs> a proposal on how those monies sh should be spent both from a, from an education perspective uh, a law enforcement perspective uh, just just a whole variety of areas he had a task force that was put together that made some recommendations so uh, that is still m moving forward I, I haven't tracked that bill as well as well as I have some other ones but I can get an update on that and we can look at that but I know that uh, you know he you know, proposal uh, came out of the governor's office, was looked at by the JBC, and acted upon by the General Assembly. I, I think that would be helpful as we move forward to kind of understand at the state level how how those how those funds are being distributed and 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 w what if if any then are coming back to our community or our county and and su and supporting supporting. I think that's all still prog uh, work okay. in progress. Okay, thanks. On the taxes, part of the fees are coming back. Yeah, Mr. Starker. So if I'm understanding this, we're, we're uh, talking about the sales tax revenue uh, directing it to be used in a more directed manner, not the other, not the other fees. And I believe so, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it, is it the fees intended to cover the, uh, Staff time. the actual costs? Yep. And then sales tax is a different item? Correct. Okay. That's on top of it. All right. That's the cherry on top of it. Okay. 
which then, then what I'm also hearing is the, is the hope that um, such sales tax would be beneficial to the schools via perhaps a, the SROs helping to fund that. Then with respect to or then with respect to question eight, I'd like to make a consensus that on the marijuana uh, related businesses that we use the sales tax revenue to um, to target that in a more directed manner directed at our schools. The city, the city sales tax revenue. All of it, hundred percent. Um, and we, we can again. Yeah, we I can think bring we that back during the budget process. Come, okay, come back and and uh, I, I guess what I would say is uh, part of the consensus is that in our annual budgeting, you know, when we go to annual budgeting, we should have we should have that revenue uh, targeted, so that we can distribute it. I guess that all means you agree. All right, good. And that was for school-related pro products, projects, though, so that we can come back with recommendations, school-related. Okay. All right. I have one more thing, and I know I'm the only one that is concerned about the future impact of this, but I'd like the council to consider every three to four months hearing from the police department and hearing from the impacts that all of this is going to have on our community and just getting an ongoing update instead of this is what we've decided, adios, and not thinking about it again. So I'm just asking that we consider getting updates from the police. Just a comment. Would that be specific to, to this? And would you want that in the form of a staff report? Um, we already do an analysis of it, so, so we could put together the, uh, you know, the figures and present it. It's just how frequently do you want that? Do you want it every three months, every four months, every six months? How would you, how would you like to see it? Enough. Just let me know. Okay. Six months sounds like. Yeah, we'll do that. Staff report. Okay. And that's a good point too. That that's probably the most important one of the most important things on this memo is we're probably going to be coming back in front of you if, um, as things change in this industry. Um, so don't be surprised if we come back with other questions. Okay. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have staff reports. Yeah, citizen, survey. citizen survey. Oh, you're right. We missed that, didn't we? I'm just wondering, can I ask a quick question about the citizen survey? Is there any concern about survey fatigue that this is like going to be the third survey going out? I mean, there's going to be this one. There's going to be the one that we're asking folks about ballot questions. And then didn't we just do one? I got online and did one just a few the survey monkey one. I'm just wondering if we should push this back to say the fall because of survey fatigue. I mean, it is to, it is statistically shown to be a problem when you throw a bunch of surveys at people. So I just am wondering if it's something that should be more of a fall type of survey. Let's wait till everybody's back.
or something. Um, Patrick, do you want to discuss that or somebody I'll, I'll else? I'll turn it right over or to Heather. Heather so we can right. get this going. I'll try to, to move this forward quickly so you can get into exec session. Um, before the break, there was a question from Council Member Davis about the timing of the survey relative to other activities, outreach activities that the city's been involved with. And um, we typically administer the survey around March timeframe every other year. So this time frame, the survey is set to go out um, later on this month, which is in just a couple weeks. So I don't think we'll have uh, survey fatigue this year. Certainly we could look at the numbers and if we see a, a drop in our percentage of participation, that's something we can consider for future years. Um, but I don't think it'll be a, an issue this year. And it's important to s be consistent every other year with the survey to keep the high percentage response rates that we've had. S okay, so I'm um, just real quick in terms of the memo. This is the fifth iteration of the survey that we're having. Typically, we were mailing to three thousand households randomly selected across the four city council districts something new that we're adding this year is the opportunity for citizens who receive a letter to take the survey to um, take the survey online and that's a convenience um, addition for this year that the national research center has been adding and clients have been utilizing that uh, we covered several of the questions that we added on the back side, page two of the memo, and certainly I can go through each of those or just answer questions um, that you have. Are Tim, you ready for that? Yeah. Uh, this looks like a lot of work, <laughs> so I congratulate you on the work. I have a couple of uh, questions and suggestions here. Sure. Uh, item number three, first column, uh, one of the options is taxes are reasonable. I, I don't like that question. Um, that seems like it's a leading question. The uh, question or that option? The option, taxes okay. are, yeah. Not the question itself, the question itself is great, but uh, I think that's a leading question when you say ta taxes are reasonable. The reason, um, if I may, the reason um, this question is a question that other communities ask based on the National Citizen Survey. So um, it is one of the characteristics that communities ask and, and they get feedback that, yeah, I live here in this community because the taxes are reasonable. So um, I appreciate your concern and cer certainly if it's a consensus of, of council, we can either reword it or just eliminate it. Um, but it is something that's asked on other surveys. Did so I just include that on the last four. We did not. This is a brand new question. Oh, brand new. Mm -hmm. okay. That that option's brand new. Um, question this question is. with the options is brand new. Oh, the yeah. whole question. Mm -hmm. I'm Genevieve? wondering if you know our property taxes are much lower. I, I don't know if somebody'd move here specifically for that reason, but maybe. I that's doubt very much that anybody thinks about that when they move here, but. Uh, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. About. Uh, anyway, I think that should be, that, that particular option should be eliminated. And uh, I hate to say this, but I kind of agree with Mr. Hill about uh, Section 8. Um, I'm not really sure why that's there. Question 8 was an attempt to, um, knowing that there's been discussion about the HEAL initiative and um, different outdoor engaging our outdoor activities engaging our citizens through live local events and things of that nature that question was intended to try to gauge what is the physical level of activity um, in our community and and it would be a brand new question we've never asked this question before so we can certainly strike it but that was the intent so why don't you, why don't you ask it in a more direct way how do you consider your health good poor 
fair? Ms. Davis. I guess my thought on that question is, like, what are we going to do with, I mean, what am I going to do with that? Then am I going to knock my neighbor's door? You fill out the survey. Let's go for a walk, you know, <laughs> which maybe I will. But, but I think, you know, I would think that the intent of the survey is that there's action taken from it. And so I guess my other question would be, you know, and it might be somewhere else in the survey because I looked at it, but I didn't memorize it. But even if we say in the last 10, 12 months, have you participated even in city activities or, or at the rec center or something to give us as a city an idea? Oh, is that number nine already? It city. is. Never mind. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I'm not sure of that question. And I mean, that, that's a good point. We, 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 we use that same test when we're going through the questions too. It's like, well, what are we going to do with that information? Yeah. And so I think that's a, the primary intent of this is we want to be able to, uh, you know, um, use the information for something, but sometimes you also want to just start tracking information too, to like see in five years, it's like, um, is your community healthy or not? But yeah, this question is actually, we put on here to, to gauge your feeling if this is something you want to do or not. So we're not, this doesn't have to stay if you don't need it, don't want it. Okay. Uh, under item five, uh, about halfway down the page there, uh, there's a question about police response time. Yes. And why don't we qualify that by putting it in number 19 where we ask if the citizen has reported a crime because otherwise how what what ability does somebody to ju have to judge police response time if they haven't called the police for some reason well, there is a don't know option so i mean if they don't if they haven't used to service the police service they can circle five which would mean they don't know or they haven't had the and we will be able with the addition of question 19 which is a brand new question based on the chief's recommendation be able to cross tab this data and so i would say being that it's a brand new question we can look at it this year and um, if we're not really seeing useful data then we can look at tweaking um, the response time um, options in the future but i know in the past surveys we have received you know decent responses and so with the addition of 19 I'd be inclined to see what kind of cross tabulation we could do and or those who have reported a crime yes. or who've been a victim of a crime because then there's also the question in terms of how 18 please rate how safe you feel in the following areas of Wheat Ridge and it's broken down by parks and playgrounds recreation centers your neighborhood and your home so collectively the cross tabulation that you can do with these three questions um, i think is of benefit to the survey but certainly open to feedback from council can i add something to number sure. eight when, when i first read that uh i too i was thought this about the the eating etc how many times have you in your household member done each of the following? Um, what I was wondering if it would be more useful if to say something as you did before uh, that the city is considering uh, more initiatives on, on healthy eating and lifestyle. Uh, do you have any interest in this area or something like that to give us somewhat of an indication uh, where we should go with it? Um, th that And also it, it says that your city is interested in this. Your city is caring about your health and and we're becoming a more modern aware city so I think there's a little PR into it as well that could be useful certainly that that type of question would be something to the effect of uh, let's see maybe 28 or 29 the city is currently considering investing funds or um, time and resources into healthy living exactly. um, initiatives exactly. do you and it would be on a uh, strongly support, somewhat support, or strongly opposed, don't know right. type scale, right. if that's what you're interested in terms of the feedback. Yep. And along the same lines as far as question eight, from the Healthy Eating Active Living Initiative, it's some par a part of it that they've described as access to healthy foods. So 
maybe some question of have you ever visited the farmers market in Wheat Ridge? Something along those lines that right. they have access. Do they feel they have access to farmers markets, local that's, foods and yeah, things? I mean, I don't, I, I don't know about how these are worded, and I don't know that I agree with them. But that's how. What other questions could we ask to get to the to get the information? Is to do our citizens feel like they have that access? Jerry. Well, uh, I, you know, I realize this has been budgeted, and it, we've done this four times, and we're going to have another survey coming out. We're meeting Friday with some, some consultants about revenue and other types of ballot questions on February, or, or in, uh, later in the year on Friday. So my question was, I know it's budgeted, but do you think we really should run this <laughs> this year? And maybe just hold, I, I thought that our main focus this year was ballot questions, revenue, even the height and density, and I just think that this is a long survey, and I would like to see this either run after the after the revenue and ballot questions, or run it next year and take a year off from it. I, I know it's budgeted. I know it's, we're, this this motion's running, but I think we can step back and say, is this survey more important, or the revenue and the height and density ballot questions, which may be coming up here on Friday when we talk to the consultant? So, and, and I would agree that we should strike eight and replace it with something else, but. My question is, is can we forego this for this year, save the money, and spend, spend our effort on the, the ballot question, the revenue ballot question, maybe add more surveys to that, and then maybe do this later in the year or next year? That's just a thought. Sure. The, the survey that um, we'll be doing, just some background information um, for the ballot question in November will be a, a phone poll, so it'll, it'll be a different format. Um, it'll probably be 300 households um, and it will be specific to um, to potential ballot questions and and it make it may cover some of these questions but very it'll be very limited I think less than 15 minute um, survey or phone poll um, so it is a little different um, we could definitely put this off um, it's just this is this is a our normal schedule um, we feel that the information that you get from this um, is Pretty beneficial to determine, get a pulse again on the community of if they think things are improving or not. But um, that's totally up to you. Um, I think it's um, good information to have when you're looking at making policy decisions. But well, see, my, um, my question don't have to do it. Is, this is going to cost us some money. So could we take this money and expand the ballot questions? Instead of 300 people, we do 600 people or 1,000 people. Well, the, the ballot the ballot questions are very specific to um, our tax um, Oh, I know, but I want questions. to get more citizens to get a better feel. I mean, 300 people out of 32,000, 31,000, I don't think that gives us, I mean, I know it's a sample, and I know it's, it's all relative, but yeah. if we could take some of this money and say to our consultant, let's not do 300 people, let's do 600 people or 1,000 people yeah. on the survey, so we can get a better feel if a revenue ballot question is going to pass. That's all I'm suggesting is I'm not trying to, I, I mean, the surveys, I, I get it, that they no, were. I'm, not, I'm not, not arguing with yeah, you. So it's, I'm just saying to council, can we maybe. I don't know if they're going to do 1,000 calls, but I think 600 is an option. Um, yeah. But, uh, so I'm saying to council, yeah. can we take this money and do a bigger, better revenue ballot question survey to get a better feel for what, our, what the community is looking at, you know. I, I would have to agree. I mean, I just, um, I, I mean, I'm just thinking, and we all, I guess, come from our own frame of mind, but I'm just thinking of um, my world where we'll use patient satisfaction, physician satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and it actually drives action items. And I know we've, we've been presented the data and we look at the data, but I don't know that it really drives and maybe it does, and I've, I've just not correlated the two, but it's not been a made driver. So, like, I know as a council person, and maybe shame on me, uh, I couldn't say, well, based off of last year's citizen survey, we've done A, B, and C. I can't say that. And so I guess my question, I, I, I agree with Mr. DiTulio that I just think that it is, you know, a lot of money, and, and I'm not sure that we're using the tool as we should, and I think we are needing to focus on something um, with the height and density and tax initiative and, and those types of things that I would rather spend um, resources in that direction. Just my thought. Uh, uh, 
point to keep in mind too that there there'll be a cost to what already has already been done. Mm -hmm. j just so you know, but I'm not, I don't know exactly right. how much that would be. But the majority of the expense is is mailing the, the surveys and 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 tabulating them. But um, they've already done some work, so there would be a cost already. I don't know if you have that um, top of your head, Heather. But I don't. There is a contract to do it, and. Um, off the top of my head, it would be half of that contractual amount, which is thirty thousand dollars. But I'll I'll go back to NRC and I'll negotiate and be figure that, out what we like could it. work out. The so. total is thirty thousand. Yes, so. the total is thirty, so it would be up to about fifteen. I would expect that we may be obligated to pay, but I I, I can negotiate. I, I am interested in pursuing the, the citizen survey because this is a, a wide range of topics. This is about parks, it's about all different kinds of things, and we're going to get a lot of information from this, and this information might help us with the ballot questions. And Christy is correct. We, we don't utilize the results well enough, good enough, um, and it's something I've been talking to Heather about, and we're we were this year going to look at on a strategy on how we use this with staff and council on to make sure that we use the data to get our money's worth. But so I, I agree with you. We don't we don't use it um, as much as we could. Um, my question would be, as it relates to questions 23 and, and 24, I would like to see an additional question. Uh, related to this that asks to what extent do you agree or disagree that the road diet on 30th Avenue between Sheridan and Wadsworth has had a positive economic effect on the city of Wheat Ridge? So either modifying question 23 or in some way changing it because the, the question is asked do you believe that 30th Avenue is the city's main street or downtown area and I don't know that that's necessarily going to flush out a whole lot of actionable items whether people agree or disagree with that so be it but as it's been said at the uh, podium and, and we've heard from citizens that there are some who believe it's had a negative impact there are some that believe it's had a positive impact and I'm willing to put it out there to allow it to be a part of the survey to that to ask the question if the majority of people that answer the survey come back and say they strongly agree that it's had a positive impact then you have that to go on if the survey comes back and it says people strongly disagree with that you have that to go on but I think it's 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 uh, does a disservice to the survey uh, to leave a, a issue so sort of striking in the community out of the survey and you you would be able to take some action on that then It's not a complete project yet either, so it might be a little. But, but it is a pilot yeah, project, and, and as such, so it have to be worded so that we can say that. Yeah. Yeah. People know in their city whether something's had a positive or a negative impact. That, that's why they were asking them what they think. Mm -hmm. Or a positive. It has yeah, the road at have a. Well, has the road diet have it? Ha, has the road had a positive impact on the city of Wheat Ridge? And I think asking a citizen survey, the citizens are expecting that question to be asked, and it's not in there. If that's the direction you want to go, I mean, there, the survey folks understand how to write questions, so they're not leading and and, and biased. So we, we could ask them to to draft something specific specific to, to the their impression of 38th Avenue. No, yeah. the yeah. see, this is where. Uh, we need to kind of understand the nuance of the issue in that people want that to be the main mm -hmm. street, they want it to be downtown, but they may disagree with the transportation implementation of the road diet or the street width So that's your question then? Right. Do you, do you agree with the road diet? No, no, no not yeah. that. No, not necessarily that. I mean, but yeah. Postponed or another time, or if there's. Do you want me to try a consensus? Or, I, mean, we're just I, I have a quick. I have a question. If we stop this halfway through, are we losing money? 
15th. Or of are we just stopping the process and we'll finish it later? That's what I'd like to do. Well, it's an option too. I think mean, we could do it at a different time. Um, so I just want to know: Are we wasting yeah. money by stopping this process right now? Fifteen thousand. Unless we could delay it. If we delay it, yeah, it, we'd have to work with around around there. So we've already have a set schedule um, with our companies, so we'd have to work with them on rescheduling at a different time. And there may be a, a, an increased cost for that. We're not I'm not sure. And the question would be: Do you want to administer the survey in the fall, or do you want to push it into next spring? Um, wait three years. Do it instead of a or biannual survey. Just, it's a, yeah. It's a three-year gap. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I can go back to NRC and try to negotiate, so minimize the impact in terms of what we need to pay out. But well, well, my goal wasn't to kill it. My goal was to postpone it so we could get our revenue ballot questions really in front of the folks first. It's already June, coming up on June, and so I wanted to be able to see what they thought about. I mean, we spent majority of our retreat on revenue. I think that's where we need, we should focus the focus now instead of doing 300 do 600 folks and try to focus on that maybe do this later in the year um, yeah I I understand some of the concerns uh, I was happy moving forward with this if the consensus is not to I'm not I don't think I'm going to kick and scream however I don't know that if we do postpone it I'm not sure that this year is the right year then to do it I, I think that it would be kicked into an awkward time of year and uh, so I think if we do end up postponing it or in a negotiating kind of uh, a, di a different contract or an extension or something like that I think perhaps what, what you mentioned about next spring would be would be where I would go with it um, so that we're not losing the work that's been done, uh, you know, money that m money that we're we're uh, uh, that we're not going to get back, and that we still get the benefit of the survey in an appropriate time uh, of year. I'm not convinced that the fall or late fall or winter is necessarily the right time to ask the uh, questions. Yeah, if we push it off, I think I think it'd be best to wait till next spring get to get it, keep it on the regular schedule. And we we have postponed it in the past because of budget reasons, so we we didn't do it biannual. Um, I think back in 2010. 2010 we skipped because of budget. They're a great company, but we we've dealt with them for numerous years, so I'm sure they would work a deal with us. Uh, and then on just to res respond to Mr. Urban's request, you know, I'm I'm not opposed in hearing some of the questions. If we do postpone it, obviously, I don't think it says uh, we don't have to kind of get to the bottom of it tonight. But um, I, I would absolutely disagree with the, with something as simple as is asking for a consensus on the road diet and I say that because I think that it's obviously a complicated design issue and that is I think very hard to to um, carefully ask in a, in a in a question maybe it has to be a series of questions or something else so I, I certainly would, would not support one that that um, uh, led to um, confusion because frankly it, it is obviously not just a road diet it, that's that's a misnomer it's it's hard it's hard to ask questions along those lines but I support the notion of, of you know that it's a topic that should be uh, queried and that we should and that we should uh, that we should address it I do support that sure. I agree with George this is this is not about the road diet is just is is really almost an inconsequential part of a bigger vision the vision is uh, an attractive, beautiful, usable main street in which people would like to walk and entertain themselves. And um, it's the road diet is just a little teeny part of that. And I think to d characterize it in that way is, is misleading. The, Madam Mayor, when you say that the road diet is inconsequential to the main street, it is the street, so it, it's not inconsequential. And I think when you ask citizens a survey, the leading topic in, in most people's mind is 38th Avenue. And most people would agree that it, they want it to be their downtown, but those that disagree with the road diet implementation feel like they haven't been heard. So let me take a shot at the consensus here, and if you guys can shoot it up or down. What I would like to ask for consensus is that we would 
postpone the, the major survey either to the spring and negotiate with the consultant so we can don't lose any money and that we would take our survey that we're going to have for the ballot questions for revenue and height and density and really make that more meaty and more robust and try to include more people in the survey. Since it's a phone survey, that's, that's it's even better, I think. And try to make more robust that survey coming up here in the next, when will that survey be, the revenue ballot the, question? The end of this month, first of next month. Um. So I'd like to increase that. Yeah visibility and that uh, promotion and add people to it. And then I don't want to cancel the survey. We've done four of them. You know, Ms. Wooden's right that we've actually can get some information out of it, but let's do this one in the fall or the spring and not lose any money. If, if no, I'm sure Heather can negotiate not, not to lose the 15,000. If we can't come back with a, you know, with a report on that. If, so that's my consensus. But the, the main thing is to really push the ballot question and get some more people involved in it. Any other discussion on that? Or can we uh, go ahead and, and vote on, on that consensus? One more discussion. So um, the, the idea of uh, canceling this at this point or postponing it until the spring or the fall so that we can buff up the, the, the ballot question survey is what's before us. It's starker. Oh, it's Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot. But I'm happy to remind you. Uh, I would not want to see this come out in the fall. No, I think so. spring's fine. Spring, I, I think, take fall out and. So we're looking at strictly a spring. <laughs> it's late. Okay. Spring. Consensus to delay to the spring. Consensus to delay to the spring. And build up our ballot. Well, it's four it passes because because yes. right. uh, Tracy left, left so. thank you thanks Heather thanks Heather thanks Heather I have none Switch states. Okay. Or stand here. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce will switch recordings to exec session. I'm Most gonna first. make the move. I move to go into no. Oh, he just handed it to me. <laughs> I move to go into executive session under charter section five point seven B and CRS twenty four dash six dash four oh two four B and E to receive legal advice and to instruct negotiators concerning 32nd Avenue construction contracts. All second. I further move to reconvene the open meeting at the conclusion of the executive session for the purpose of taking any actions deemed necessary. Well, I would have seconded that. Yes, I'll second that. Aye. Does that motion pass? It does. Bruce, if you can start a new uh, recording. Give me a minute. And the video's off, right? Yes. 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 